Can I welcome everyone to the 10th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two. The committee will take evidence on alcohol licensing in Scotland. This session was previously delayed due to a cabinet reshuffle last year, and I welcome the Minister for Community Safety, Ash Denham, who now has lead portfolio responsibility for alcohol licensing. I also welcome Peter Reid, team leader, licensing, criminal law practice and licensing unit at the Scottish Government, accompanying the Minister today. And I invite the Minister to make any opening remarks. Thank you, Convener. Yes, just briefly. So thank you very much for the invitation to appear this morning to discuss um, alcohol licensing. Um, I understand the committee wants to discuss community involvement in the alcohol licensing process and other issues related to licensing that were raised. Um, I know the committee meeting was, was held last year. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and as members will know that um, today's session had been due to take place last year um, with the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Michael Matheson, and he was going to give evidence at that time. But obviously, as a result of the reshuffle, um, that appearance was postponed. Um, as a Minister for Community Safety, that portfolio responsibility has now been passed to the Minister, so that um, obviously comes under myself. And um, it may be helpful if I maybe provide a quick overview of the regime. So, as members will be aware, the main piece of legislation that controls the sale of alcohol in Scotland is the Licensing Scotland Act of 2005, which came into effect um, full effect in late 2009, and this has since been added to further by both primary and secondary legislation. Um, but the most recent piece of primary legislation to make changes to the alcohol licensing regime is the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Act of 2015. Um, meanwhile, the day-to-day -day responsibility for administration of the alcohol licensing regime rests with licensing boards. Um, the boards are made up of elected councillors from relevant um, councils, but they are independent public bodies separate from the local authority. And all boards have a wide discretion to determine appropriate licensing arrangements um, according to local needs and circumstances and with their own legal advice. And the key strategic role of a board is the preparation of the licensing policy statement for its area. And within this policy statement, there will be an over-provision assessment, which states whether the board considers there to be over-provision of licensed premises in its area. And it's important to emphasise that licensing boards have responsibility for individual licensing decisions, and these are not issues that the Scottish Government intervenes in. And the role of the local licensing forum, which I know was a topic that came up um, in the last meeting, um, is to keep under review the operation of the licensing system in the area and to give advice and recommendations um, to the board. And I'm sure uh, we'll uh, be discussing that further today. So I know there's a number of other issues the committee um, might want to raise, and I'm happy to take any questions on that. Thank you very much, Minister. And um, I'll go straight to questions, and Annabelle, you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Minister. Picking up on the issue of the local licensing forums, um, I, I understand, in fact, that there is a, a consultation out at the moment on uh, the draft revised guidance for licensing boards, and that within that consultation, the role of local licensing forums will be kind of looked at. Um, in that regard, I mean, what does what does the minister see as the the possible outcome with regard to that discussion? What what role should the local licensing forums be playing? Because I think there is a feeling that there's a bit of confusion about what the role is uh, and indeed whether perhaps the role could be strengthened in, in various respects, but perhaps the Minister could give her initial thoughts on that. Yeah, so obviously the role of the, of the forum is to keep um, a review of the operation of the licensing system in their air, so that's their function, and um, to put forward advice and recommendations to the board. So um, I think, I mean, my view would be that a local licensing forum ha does have a vital role to play in that. So obviously they're um, representing different communities um, of interest and ensuring that um, a number of views are put forward um, to the board, that they're considered and that they're debated. So I think they are um, very important. I think it's also, um, it's good if forums can um, try to be as proactive as possible uh, and trying to get a diversity of, of people to attend those meetings so that they get that breadth of views. Um, there is some very good um, practice that we've seen. I think the committee will have seen that in the evidence that the committee took last year. Um, the one that struck me was um, one of the forums that had gone out to speak to modern study students in a local high school and they'd then taken suggestions from them about a local event that was going to be happening and found that quite useful. So I think there is um, evidence of really good practice of forums working really well. But obviously in other areas, there's examples where forums are, are not working so well. And so uh, to pick up on your question, I think that's where the guidance 
um, you know, would, would come into play. So obviously the guidance that um, we're consulting on that at the moment, so my officials have been working with a number of, of stakeholders over, I'll ask Peter to come in in a minute and just give a little bit more detail on that, but a number of stakeholders um, over the last few months um, to get as much engagement as possible and as much um, input into improving the guidance to make it as clear and as helpful as possible. And um, there will certainly be um, a, a part of that, which will be for boards in how they can support forums better and, and sharing that good practice. But I'll ask Peter to give a little okay. bit more colour on that. OK, thank you very much. Uh, the role of the licensing forums is set out in the legislation and th that that's that's not like not not due for change anytime soon. We're not working on another licensing bill at the moment. Uh, and I, I would sort of make the point that Boards vary enormously in size and resources, so you know what, there's options available to the very large boards to, to be very proactive and do a lot of work. Whereas you've got some sm very small boards, you know, with you know, I think there's one board with less than a hundred premises licences uh, un under its responsibility. So the resources available to some of the boards are a lot less. So nationally, you know, we understand that there's going to be a variety of levels of practice and engagement possible and appropriate at, lo at local authority level. Uh, the, license, the statutory guidance that we're working on at the moment, it includes, includes a chapter related to licensing forums, uh, encouraging good practice and sort of giving examples. As the guidance has to reflect the underlying legislation, it may be that there's rules for other, you know, it's the guidance at the moment is guidance for licensing boards. It could be that there's scope for other guidance uh, for other audiences. That, that, could, that might be one of the you know, one of the things that we draw from the consultation responses and it's something that we'd be happy to look at. You know, we would like to see forums operating effectively. We see that there's good practice and we'd like to encourage local authorities to adopt good practice. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, uh, in terms of the, the views that the committee had heard, um, so uh, suggestions included training, perhaps for forum members, access to a budget, um, better guidance, which obviously the government's looking at, and perhaps even a national support uh, body. Um, are these issues actively under consideration? Uh, I, I should, should admit, I am, I've been an active, active in my community council for the past you know, more, than, more than a decade. I also, uh, you know, from time to ten, time, attend my local licensing forum uh, as an as sort of ad hoc member as well. So I, I, I do have a degree of familiarity with what happens on the ground. Uh, my impression is that, I, as with all these sort of engagement mechanisms, uh, they are they can can unfortunately be quite reliant on the usual suspects, people that are retired or people that are involved in quite a lot of groups, and it is genuinely difficult to bring more folk in. So we would be happy to consider you know help you know things that work, and I think you know the best. The best source of that will be at local authorities that are actually have successful forums, and then they can inform on what seems to work well in their area. I think nationally, some some of these ideas may not may not be fully appropriate. I don't think mandatory training for forum mem forum members, you know, for my engagement, would really encourage more people to attend. But I think more support and making it easier and more meaningful when the, when they are there, I think, might make more difference. But you know, the local authorities on the ground will have much more. Ex they will have plenty of experience on what works in local engagement. Okay, when, when is the consultation to come to an end? It's three months consultation. 11th of June. 11th of June. So we would encourage people who <coughs> obviously do have views on this to obviously get in, involved yeah. and um, give us their feedback. And yeah, I think that's take important that into account. to make a call for all the people watching our proceedings as we speak. Um, in terms of, can you just one last line? Um, so <clears throat> I, I hear what he said, and obviously the consultation is ongoing, and that's all good and well. I, I would be concerned that in the whole process, so in Fife, for example, there's a very uh, a successful um, uh, organisation, the Five Alcohol Support Service, which has, I think, last year celebrated its 40th anniversary. It provides frontline counselling. It is on the front line. It will have lots of views about issues that are being dealt with day and daily. And I just wonder, what is the possibility for having a system whereby organisations like the Five Alcohol and Support Service can uh, be involved? Because they will have a lot to say. And I, I, I sense here we're getting onto a public health uh, which is not the minister's direct responsibility, but how does that? How could that work so that we use the expertise on the ground? 
Well, they could certainly be members of the forum. I mean, that, that would be a, a useful way for that to go forward. And then obviously that expertise can then be given, as I spoke of earlier, about advice and recommendations being then given onto the board. So that certainly would be a way to do that. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you. Graeme, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, it was really, uh, you, you, you mentioned it, Mr Reid, um, the, the difficulty of actually getting people to attend some of these forums. Um, and I certainly know from my experience of having sat on the licensing board um, that the the forum in the the area that I was in was re really not very successful um, did hardly ever met um, and it was the usual suspects and I felt there was a, a disconnect I don't know what you you found or what the ministers found it certainly a disconnect between the board and the forum um, because of those issues, because there weren't very many people. I mean, hardly, hardly anyone turned up. So you might, you might have good practice in some places, but there'll be very bad practice elsewhere. I don't know what your reflections are on that. Yes, I'll let Peter come in in a moment, but I guess that's the point of updating the guidance. Um, and so that in areas where we have seen really good practice, where, for instance, you know, the forums have a plan for the year, they decide what they're going to look into, it's clearly it's engaging and useful for the people that are involved, and then it provides good advice and recommendations to the board, and there's a good linkage between the two. That's obviously something that we'd like to replicate across the country. And so in the guidance, we're going to be putting in examples of that sort of thing so that, you know, obviously we can try to share that, that good practice across the whole of Scotland. Peter? Uh, coming back, you, you make an interesting point there. I, you know, it, it prompts some thoughts with me that, Perhaps, you know, certainly the, the licensing forum that I attend it sort of has quarterly meetings at, at the local council headquarters uh, that are, you know, sort of have an agenda and a chair and are quite formal. And it, it might well be that that sort of, you know, in, in the modern age, that sort of model of engagement isn't particularly attractive to a lot of people. Clearly, it isn't. It may be that, you know, we need to be thinking a bit more creatively about what might meaningfully bring people in, because certainly these are issues that a lot of people have a lot of opinions on and would like to engage with. So, you know, yeah, there, there probably is, you know, scope for thinking to move on and other approaches to be adopted. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the difficulties uh, that, that we certainly had was trying to get young people interested, because um, clearly they should, they should be, but you can't force them to be. Uh, I think you have to make it interesting. Uh, and at the moment, it's, it's just not. And that, I think most members of the public well, A, they'll have no idea what the board does, but they'll certainly have no idea what the forum does. Um, so I think the, 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 you know, there, is a, there is a challenge there. And the other uh, problem we had, sorry to go on, convener, but just talking from experience, um, yeah. um, was the health, the health board wasn't really engaged, and they should, they, they, they should have been. I don't, I don't know if you've done any research across the country to see levels of engagement of di different groups in these forums? I'm afraid I haven't got down to that level <coughs> of detail. It, it may be something Alcohol Focus Scotland has looked at. They, they engage quite closely with the forums. But um, on a forum, you know, there should be somebody nominated from the health board, so that, so that is, you know, that, that is part of the membership um, that should be made up. But um, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I think that came through in the evidence as well from last year, that some of the people giving evidence said that they found, you know, that um, the meetings were held in, you know, the council chambers. It was quite intimidating, you know, for for lay people who are maybe not used to this kind of environment, that they felt going along to that and maybe speaking up, you know, was a bit off-putting for them. So I think maybe, um, you know, that's something to think about how to make it. Engaging, how to make it informal, welcoming, so that people can come in. And again, um, just going back to your point about young people, obviously I spoke about that a little before. Maybe the the issue there is rather than waiting for young people to come to them, maybe you have to go to the young people. Maybe you have to engage with modern studies teachers in the locality and so on, and see if there's ways that um, that that is a way to capture the views of young people. But I agree with you. I can see that you know there is some difficulty in trying to attract young people to these things. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alec. Well done. Is, 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 um, is there a danger that these, these forums are seen more as like a tick box exercise to say we're, we're engaging? Because if you look at the evaluation that was done by MESAS, which is Monitoring and Evaluation Strategic Group, in 2013, they highlight structural issues with local licensing forums. And they say that these include a lack of power and a lack of clarity about the role 
Now, I think you have said you, there's no intention to bring forward legislation, but you know, if there's a lack of clarity uh, about the role and a lack of what powers they actually have, what's if people don't get that, then then are they a tick box exercise? No, I don't think they are, but I think we have covered already in this session that they're working really well in some areas and they're not working so well in others. And, you know, as a government, that's something that we can um, try to give as much help and support with that, and we're happy to do that. So um, officials have actually um, engaged with, I think, all the boards um, and offered them, you know, support into, you know, any support that they think that would be useful. Um, none of them have actually taken the government up on that. So the government is happy to give that support, advice, you know, clarity, and, and clearly our guidance will do that as well. Sorry, if I may come... I, I I think that's in relation to the personal licence holder uh, right, issue okay. rather than forms. But I, it's certainly in, in relation to engaging with uh, licensing boards, uh, I, I attend the quarterly meeting of the local licensing, uh, the networking, so our networking group for local licensing solicitors, and you take you hear views and provide updates to them. So I'm well engaged with them and aware of you know, the good work that they do and. Take, you know, take on board the concerns that they raise uh, and uh, remain happy to do that. I think it would be interesting, I mean, you keep talking about examples of best practice, it would be interesting to, to see further information on that. Because um, the boards are quasi-judicial. I've never been to a licensing board, but I know that there's, there's lots of lawyers that go to them and and there's, there's, there's in-depth training of members of the licensing board, because they are quasi-judicial. So to what extent would they be influenced by, or to what extent would forums have any kind of power over them? And if you take one example, the over-provision that came in in 2015, I mean, when that when that legislation came in, it was clear that there was, it was shown that there was clear correlation between highly areas of deprivation and poverty and over provision of alcohol sales outlets. Um, you know, is there examples where these forums have been able to look at that kind of detail and actually have any influence on it? I'll let Peter answer that. The, that's the sort of thing that we would expect the board to engage with. I can't remember off the top of my head whether it's a statutory responsibility, but certainly we'd expect the board to engage directly with the forum. I think the board's also obliged to have an annual meeting with uh, members of the forum as well. And I think as as with any of these, you know, while you know we're, we're talking about a board having a sort of quasi judicial role, you know, they they do have a role in relation to individual applications and reviews and that they also have a more strategic role which is linked to the licensing policy statement and over provision as you've mentioned and i think that is where having the resource of the forum which brings in a broad mix of police nhs communities trade allows a, you know gives the forum and that gives the board a natural you know, sort of resource a hinterland to fall back on and seek views and challenge from, and I think that you know that is a you know a useful and valuable role for the forum. And I think, as you know, I would imagine a board might well find that useful in themselves, just to test out their ideas and thinking. You know, seeing those in front of a forum and seeing the reactions that the forum in front, you know, the, the forum have to those ideas and approaches, you know, would find that invigorating and useful as well. I, you know, I think most of us, you know, value, you know, engagement in the views of others. I think it would be interesting, convener, if the committee was able to get the best practice, but also if we were able to get the data in terms of how legislation like the over-provision powers are being used and what linkage there is with, with licensing forums around that, so we can actually see in practice how these things are working. Committee witnesses agreed that support from local authorities, particularly in the form of staff time, was an important factor uh, for successful forums. Again, we see that, that these, these services within local authorities are under massive financial pressure. Do you think there's the capacity there to be able to support these forums to have a meaningful role where they do have some powers uh, and there is clarity about the role? Well, obviously it's for the local authority to um, support the boards and, and the forums, but we are aware that resourcing um, can be 
a challenge for boards and so that's why we are um, about to consult uh, shortly on the occasional licence fee. So the fee for that at the moment is £10. Um, I think it's been, I'll let Peter give a bit more detail, but I think it's been at that level for quite some time now. And um, that, if we consult on that and um, decide to raise that, that could be um, an important source of, of revenue as well, which may lead to um, better resourcing. I wonder which local authority staff, licensed staff, actually think of the forums. <laughs> Are they tick box? It's a question for them, but anyway, convener. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Andy. Thanks very much. <clears throat> A convener. At the discussion we had in, in May last year, there was some discussion um, and concern expressed around the over-provision provisions, um, and that it was originally intended to focus on public order, uh, but that it was very unclear if the law supported the expansion of those powers to deal with public health issues. And um, it's been drawn to our attention that this has proved fraught with legal difficulty. Um, what's the view of the government on whether over-provision powers should be able to deal with public health and whether the law is in a fit state, in fact, to do that? Well, obviously, uh, there's uh, two portfolios there, because obviously this um, comes under justice, and then you obviously have the public health aspect. And we do, as a government, obviously um, recognise that you at times you need to work um, between portfolios. You can't work with things in a silo. Um, and clearly the Scottish Government has been working quite hard to reduce alcohol-related harm, and I'm thinking of things like minimum unit pricing and multi-buys and, and that kind of thing. Um, obviously, I've seen the report, you know, AFS um, brought out a report, I think it was, was it in May um, last year, um, where it was drawing a link between over-provision and crime and, over and other types of harm. So it's something I think the government is, is definitely looking at. But in terms of over-provision as it stands with the, with the licensing regime, um, obviously, the powers is there for the um, for the board to determine. Um, they obviously have to put a statement about levels of over provision, and it's up to them to decide if there is over provision in their area, and then they can act on that. And obviously, um, you know, they need to be robustly evidenced. Um, Peter will give a bit more detail, but there are uh, many examples where boards have, you know, used those powers um, so quite successfully. So I'll let Peter give a bit more detail. Okay. Uh, the w w over provision. It, it's one of these areas that's always going to be quite fraught. It's always going to be open to debate. There's always going to be different different opinions. You know, we recognise that. We we know it's going to be difficult. Uh, we're we're doing what we can to support boards in you know, you know, finding you know, making a finding of over provision if that's what they want to do. Uh, the guidance, as as we've already mentioned, has been updated substantially. There's been a lot of legal up, legal discussion on this to try and make it more straightforward on the process and easier for boards to, to make use of. Uh, that will hopefully help them with the process, which is often the stumbling block, you know, which can unfortunately be a stumbling block where a board wants to do something and stumbles with the process. We hope that the guidance will make that a lot easier. Uh, we've also, you know, in the 2015 Act, we're mindful of concerns raised in particular by Alcohol Focus Scotland in relation to over provision. One of the, you know, they made a number of good points that which, which, we've taken for, which were taken forward in the 2015 Act. Uh, in relation to over provision, there was one in relation to making it absolutely clear that a board could determine that their entire board area was a locality for the purposes of over-provision. This would then make it a lot easier for a board to make use of public health evidence, which is generally available for a much larger area. You know, it would be challenging to find public health evidence for Socky Hall Street. Finding you know, public health evidence for South Lanarkshire as a whole would be a lot more straightforward. Making it absolutely clear in the legislation that a board could determine that, that the entire board area was a locality for the purposes of over-provision makes using public health data and finding over provision on public health grounds a lot more straightforward for them and would certainly you know, encourage them to do so. So are you saying, therefore, that, that it is clear in law that public health um, uh, cr criteria over a licensing board area can be used as a, a, a reason for restricting alcohol licensing? Can be licensing considered as part of the evidence that the board... You know, it's, that's part of the evidence that the board can consider, yes. And are you confident that the legal framework within which such decisions will be made is, is, is watertight in that regard? I don't think we could ever promise that the legal because framework... Because that's the problem that's been highlighted. 
is that it's not clear whether you can use public health grounds, uh, you can use the over provision um, provisions of the Act to tackle public health questions. I think so. You know, it's one of the, the public health represents one of the five underlying ob underlying objectives within the Act, and boards certainly have used public you know, used public health arguments in the past, and I expect them to continue to do so. Yes, but that's I mean that is the purpose of the updating the guidance, you know, to provide as much clarity, help, and support um, to boards so that they're able to make these decisions and to make make it clear to them. Um, one other issue that has been raised has been the need to establish a dependable causal link between harm and over provision. Mm -hmm. Um, and the concern that that's a barrier to using over provision to address public health concerns. What's your views? I think this is this is an issue that's you know been been of you know considerable legal debate, uh, and certainly in developing the guidance, you know, there was considerable legal debate on what exactly some of these terms meant, like dependable causal link, uh, rebuttable rebuttable presumption and that, and we've tried to make these as clear as we can in the guidance in order to, to help boards in their understanding of how it works. I think there was there was considerable discussion on this amongst lawyers. I'm not a lawyer myself, but I think my take on it was, uh, sorry, my thread? We were talking about rebuttable presumption. I think yes. my take on it was that, that the causal link Ex, you know, as a matter of law, that there has to be some form of causal link. However, we've, in, within the guidance, we've tried to make it clear how boards can evidence that causal link in, in preparing their over provision, in preparing their over provision assessment. You know, and you know, the standard is on the balance of pro probabilities. So it's not an insurmountable. We don't feel that that is an insurmountable barrier to a board arriving at an over provision assessment. You know, it's just you know, it's, it's a matter of the law. So, so there's no current um, plan to change the law in that area, but obviously we would be interested in the committee's views on, on that, and we would take that into consideration. We will keep it under review. But if the evidence is that this is a, a complicated area of law, and which is at some dispute, guidance is not going to. I mean, guidance can can help people, give them a bit more confidence, perhaps in reaching decisions, but it's not going to change the underlying um, tensions that are there. Um, if it, and, and the government has got a, a good um, track record in continuing to try and deal with public health concerns around alcohol, it's pretty clear to me that licensing has to be one of the tools one uses to address public health concerns. So if it proves that, if, if it can be shown that this is a, remains an area of legal dispute, will the government move to change the law to make it beyond doubt that over-provision can be used to tackle public health questions? Over-provision can be used to tackle public health concerns. I, I think you've latched on to a view expressed by a stakeholder, but I don't think that's a wide... My feeling is that that's not a widely held view. You know, many boards have successfully demonstrated there is over-provision and they have successfully defended that in the courts. But as I said, you know, the updated guidance will help, hopefully help with that. It will give more clarity around that. If this is something that we feel is ongoing and there is a problem, we are keeping this under review and we will look at it as a government, yes. OK, thanks. i just clarify, if, if the boards have already found it over provision that they can use that, they, they can use that, it's just a case of some have used it better than others and that's how they've found in their favour and not the others. It's not really changing the law you would think would be required at this stage. Yes. Right, thank you. Uh, Kenny, if you wanted to come. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, online uh, and out of town uh, alcohol sales, out of town supermarket alcohol sales contribute certainly to over consumption, and I would think that supermarket sales would certainly uh, contribute to over provision. So I'm just wondering how the Scottish Government and licensing boards are able to tackle these issues. Uh, well, obviously, we, we know that there's a, obviously there's a changing trend, isn't there, about how people buy and, can, and consume alcohol. So um, we, we, we're seeing that. So as part of the alcohol framework of 2018, there is um, government work being undertaken to understand sort of the online sales and, and how that's sort of interacting. We are looking at that area, but I'll let Peter just um, explain it from the licensing perspective. 
Uh, premises that sell alcohol will will have a premises license, so those will be considered by a board in the normal run of things. Uh, as, as you as you allude, the you know there is a growing trend towards the online sale of alcohol. There, as the minister said, there's research being carried out, and we'll con you know consider the findings of that. It's it, it's not an easy. It's not an easy issue as to what you, what you might do, uh, but we will be interested in views on it. Yeah, because you might have an area where there are not many, you know, off sales in the area or outlets, but the, those people can then drive to a supermarket a couple of miles away. Or those could be the people who are actually more likely to actually buy online. So you end up getting a distorted picture of where alcohol is actually being consumed. I'm just wondering if there's any research going into into that, so we can get a more accurate picture of alcohol consumption in Scotland. Yes, so that's been covered under the research that's been done under the alcohol framework, um, but that's been done by public health colleagues. Okay, excellent. And, and just if I may, well, another area I was going to touch on. Uh, I mean, last year it became a requirement for licensed boards to produce annual function reports, which can be used uh, by communities to scrutinise their work. And, but these obviously vary quite considerably in terms of their content and format. And I'm just wondering if there's any uh, commitment from the government to produce um, practice guidance to kind of aid this function, perhaps in, ensure best practice and, and kind of standardisation. Yes, uh, obviously we've uh, seen them and um, they seem to be varying from four pages in length to 358 pages in length. So clearly there is quite a bit of diversity there. But obviously clearly that will reflect different local areas. Some will have many premises and some won't, so perhaps that, that plays into it. Um, we, uh, the, uh, my officials have just received an analysis on the report a few days ago, and um, so we're studying that, the one from Alcohol Focus Scotland, about um, the, these reports, the annual functions reports. I think the other thing we need to be aware of is we don't want to um, unduly burden them as well. We need to make sure that what we're asking them to do, you know, is is useful and appropriate. So um, we are looking into that, and we do expect that the guidance will um, again address uh, issues around that, and uh, to try to make sure that these reports are, um, you know, I mean, we don't want them to be completely standardised. We obviously want to give them, um, you know, uh, up, they can uh, write them in the way that they want, but we obviously want them to be um, useful to um, add clarity to the issue as well. But I'll let Peter add a little bit more to that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the functions reports, uh, that, that was one of two additional reporting requirements brought in by the uh, 2015 Act. The previous, the, the other one was an income and expenditure report. What we did with, uh, we did with the income and expenditure report was we did a, you know, we met with, we met in, you know, sort of fairly informally with boards and just had a discussion about how, what, you know, what might be useful for inclusion in these reports, and what might, you know, and how, what they might look like. Uh, we, we, I think we maybe got an example from a, a board that had done one, shared that, and did a minute of the meeting and shared that with local authority, with the boards themselves, for them to consider, for, you know, to provide them a bit of a steer for when they provided the income and expenditure reports. Uh, when the functions report was coming in, we spoke to the, you know board solicitors again and the feedback we got from them that that sort of a fairly light touch approach at the beginning in terms of the income and expenditure reports had worked well and they would welcome a similar sort of approach for the annual function support so we did some light engagement with the local authorities boards and also with alcohol focus scotland which is alluded to in the you know the, the report that alcohol Fo focus scotland did and you know a minute of that was then circulated to the the boards to help inform them i think the fact that now boards have prepared a first functions report so they will be able to see other boards functions report there's also the overarching analysis that efs have done i think that will help inform improvements in doing these reports i think you know they will you know hopefully see pick up good examples from elsewhere and you know and reflect on what's probably worked better or not so well within their own reports as an annual report i don't think we would necessarily be rushing immediately to do a a review. I think a few a, a few reports down the line would would be a far more appropriate stage to look at them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Graham. You wanted to come in. Yeah, I just want to uh, knit, knit back to over provision if we can. Um, we had a, a written submission from Alcohol Focus Scotland, which you, you hopefully you've seen, um, and they refer to the draft guidance on this. Um, if we can just read you what they say, and you can respond to it. Um, this document has no statutory authority and, in AFS's view, is not fit for purpose. The poor drafting risks exacerbating the existing confusion and ambiguity that the update was intended to address. 
particularly in relation to the crucial section on over-provision. So what would your response be to those I'll comments? I'll let Peter answer that one. Yeah. Uh, the, no, I didn't know. Take, take you back a bit here uh, to kind of ex, ex, provide a bit of context around this. Uh, the the work on doing updating statutory guidance is a very substantial has been a very substantial undertaking. We started it in 2017. Uh, we've we've been working with a wider range of stakeholders. Uh, Institute of Licensing Council uh, brought together a lot of stakeholders, including Alcohol Focus Scotland, to work on it. Uh, so you've, we've got the, the work and the guidance starting in 2017. Uh, in parallel, the, there was a revised requirement within in relation to the licensing policy statements. Uh, the licensing policy statements, you know, the key strategic document for licensing boards. In the past, they were prepared every three years, but you know, it was a, it was a recommendation by AFS amongst others that this didn't work too well uh, and it would be much better to more closely align the, the licensing policy statements as strategic documents with the duration of the licensing board that owned them. So that's what we did in the 2015 Act. So the 2015 Act gave boards, gave the new board 18 months to settle down and then prepare a new licensing policy statement so that they felt ownership of this. So that that's reasonable enough, but the result of that was that that gave a November 2018 deadline for these licensing policy statements to be published. Uh, we weren't going to have the guidance finished by then. When speaking to licensing board clerks, they were saying that they were worried that the guidance would com completely contradict the work that they had been doing on developing these licensing policy statements. They weren't sure whether they should be doing it. They think they would be undermined. So we prioritised doing work on the relevant chapters in relation to over-provision and licensing policy statements to get a workable draft. And that was shared informally with stakeholders, including the licensing boards, to give them the reassurance that they should carry on on an important work that they were doing on the licensing policy statements due for publication in November 2018, uh, they were, you know, the impression I got was they were reassured, they carried on, they published those documents. I, it would have been unfortunate to lose those, you know, lose the publication of those 2015, you know, 2018 licensing policy statements for the sake of putting the time into doing the guidance properly. I think you know, the boards were reassured by what they saw. They, they produced the licensing policy statements. It, it wasn't an ideal situation, but you were dealing with change. And I think we came up with the best, you know, the best compromise we could. I'm not sure whether you're agreeing or disagreeing with them. <laughs> <laughs> they described the, the guidance as not fit for purpose. That's quite strong. I, th I think Alcohol Focus Scotland have a, have a particular set of views, and they're, they they're robust in expressing those. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alexander. Thank you, Kim. We've talked uh, this morning about the process and the, the guidance that's been put in place and also the provision. But when it comes to local residents, they really find it quite difficult sometimes to understand how they uh, become involved in the whole process because there is a lack of understanding uh, about how they can participate and what they can do. Uh, they, they live sometimes within that environment that has detrimental effect to them or they, or they see what's happening. But they, they find it quite a, a minefield to go through to see how, you, how they can support themselves and how they can uh, ensure that their views are expressed. So can I ask, you know, do you think that more can be done uh, in the current system to ensure that local residents can express their views in a, a more pronounced way? Uh, there's always more that can be done, uh, um, but I think in this case, there are lots of opportunities um, for local residents to express their views already. Um, so the licensing regime, you know, has that sort of baked into it, if you like. Um, so um, boards can engage um, and they obviously do their policy statement. Residents can obviously um, feed into their local licensing forum. They can attend meetings. They can attend meetings of the board. Um, they can speak to their local councillors who sit on, on the boards. So I think I, I do take your point that sometimes people may not, um, you know, potentially have the, have the awareness of that. But certainly that, that facility is there and people can take advantage of it. And, you, and you've touched on there the role of the, the councillor and also the community council, yep. as we, you talked about mm -hmm. attending that yourself. So they are seen as the, the, their representatives mm -hmm. uh, to express their views and their opinions. But there seems to still be some barriers as to how, that's, how that can be achieved. Uh, because if you've gone to a licensing meeting uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and seen how it performs, it, it, it does look a little bit more of a, a court environment. It's mm -hmm. got some flavour to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
individuals do not see how they uh, get the chance to participate in that. Uh, the, 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 the applicant uh, may well have representation uh, and there may well be some discussion from the forum or from interested parties about how that can take place. But do you think there's a bigger role uh, for councillors and the community councils mm -hmm. uh, in ensuring that these rules uh, and people can get the opportunity to express their views and opinions? Mm -hmm. Well, community councils obviously are they are a statutory consultee for premises licence, and so obviously we'd always encourage them to, to put forward their views uh, in that case. Um, and um, certainly, obviously, individuals can you know if they if they're worried about premises near them, you know that anybody can and request um, that to be reviewed. So there are lots of mechanisms. There are, are lots of ways that people can engage. But I'll ask if Peter's got any more detail yeah. on that. I'll I'll also make mention of the licensing standards officers that they are a role under statute, uh, and they have a role you know a role to provide support and advice and to mediate. Uh, and certainly, the MESAS report that was touched on earlier reported very favourably on the licensing standards officers and the positive impact they have. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm about and about a lot, and I, I, I very seldom hear a bad word about them. I hear nothing but praise think, for their efforts. I think they, they do. They, they have a role to play and a very vital mm. role mm -hmm. uh, in ensuring that uh, some of that information is, is uh, processed back and forward from uh, the, the council or, or from uh, the, the licence forum or individuals themselves to ensure that they have that participation and the community feel involved. Uh, but, but there was talk about the and witnesses have come back to us when we were discussing this in the past, talked about the, the lack of understanding of the licensing system and the barriers that were put up to participation. Uh, so what do you, the Scottish Government think they can do to in, increase that understanding? Because the, there is still a barrier there. Many, many, uh, as I say, of, uh, of the witnesses you've had talk about that barrier, talk about not being able to uh, process it. Mm -hmm. So th there has to be something more that needs to be done uh, to ensure that, that that is the case. Well, obviously, this got, we don't want there to be barriers to people participating. I mean, that's clearly we want to encourage community engagement. Um, and that's uh, why you know, we have the local forums and so on. It's all designed around making sure we get a diversity of views in that can then feed into the board. Um, I... Um, I, I know we keep talking about it, but um, there's certainly, I think that's an issue that probably, um, I'll ask Peter to confirm that, is that going to be covered in the guidance as well? The guidance is primarily addressed is, as documents in the licensing okay. boards, but certainly I heard a suggestion the other day that, you know, there might be value in sort of advice for, you know, mm -hmm people that wanted to make objections. Mm -hmm. And certainly, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know I, I don't think we'd have any problem with you know, Scottish mm -hmm. government preparing yeah. some advice short, you know, yeah. because obviously if you're, if you're writing advice guidance for boards, then that is written in a certain style and it's not going to be as accessible. For a you know, for somebody that's maybe concerned about a premises opening next door to them or nuisance, they will, you know, they will want to know if I'm if I wanted to make an objection, what, what sort of points yeah. would I want to get across? And I think as within government, we, we could prepare something and publish that on the website as, I, as I, I, sort of I, an adjunct that, to the guidance. That, that would certainly help, because they say some people see it a bit of a minefield, because it's, a, it's quite remote uh, mm. uh, uh, and it's quite legal. Uh, and they, they don't feel maybe they've got the, the qualifications or the understanding. Uh, so by giving them some kind of template or some kind of rule that said this, these would be expected or these are the areas that might be covered, uh, I think would give them more confidence in the system. And that's what we want. We want people to have more confidence mm. in the system going forward. I take the member's point on that, and I think that we'd be happy to look into that and see if there's something that we could publish that would be helpful in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Al, you want I to mean, come? just just a quick point on that. I, I, I do think that it would be fair to say most people are not lying in their beds at night worrying about the local licensing policy. However, where where people where people have an issue, and that's that's where I would agree entirely with your view that the the licensing standards officers. My experience has always been that they do do a good job, and people want to know that where there is issues, they have they're able to respond to them. I wonder. Has the government done or would it consider having a look at the resources available within licensing boards? Because that clearly impacts. We can talk all day around these issues, but if the capacity does not exist within the local authorities to be able to respond to public concerns, so is that something that the government either has been looking at or is that something that you would be prepared to do so that we as a committee could have a look at that? We are looking at that, but I'll get Peter to give you the detail on that. Uh, the Obviously, so resources for boards are a perennial concern. Uh, there was we did undertake some work a while ago on you know looking at the you know the board fee the fee levels uh, in relation to licensing. However, we 
faced a stumbling block in that it was difficult to get to get enough information to really form views as to whether the fee levels were appropriate. That's why in the 2015 Act we set up the requirement to have an income and expenditure report, which would then meant, meant that we were getting information from across boards in Scotland on the levels of income and expenditure that they had. Uh, as already mentioned, we intend to look at whether the occasional fee is set at an appropriate level coming up. And in further to that, we intend to look more properly at the overall levels of fees and expenditures within boards across Scotland and whether that should inform a change to the existing fee structure. Uh, obviously, you would need to balance you know, the interests of you know, people that might apply for board, apply for a licence at a certain stage, that it wouldn't be set at a you know, punitive or distorting effect, but it, you know, similarly ensure that boards had appropriate resources to carry out their functions properly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've just got a couple of points. One was uh, you talked about the LSOs early on and how well respected the, the job's been. We are hearing some evidence that the role's under some pressure. Exactly. Could you tell us what the Scottish Government are doing to help local authorities recognise the value and provide adequate staff resources in this area? Um, so obviously the Licensing Act of 2005, that does requires the local authorities to appoint at least one LSO in their area. So um, the data, I'll just give you the data that the Scottish Government's got at the moment. So um, the numbers have fallen from 63.6 .6 in 2011-12 to 59, uh, or just over 59 in 2017-18. And, and we're hearing the same thing, that um, concerns that LSOs are being expected to cover additional duties. Um, for example, the recently created Civic um, Licensing Standards Officer role. So, but I think as a, we will keep that under review, and um, if we can get some more data, we'd be happy to share that with the committee. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. Okay, I'd like to go back to the 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 community area. The the licence boards, for understandable reasons, currently set out with the community planning and council strategic planning fr frameworks. That helps with their independence, but but it does make it difficult to connect alcohol licensing to the other community initiatives. And do you think there's any benefit in the, the licensing boards being required to be more connected to community planning work? I mean, there's nothing to stop um, boards going beyond the current um, laid down minimum requirements when they undertake um, that engagement. Um, and obviously, when they're developing the licensing policy statement, and that does uh, present a really good, it's a timely op opportunity to engage as, as widely as possible. And many boards do do that. But if the committee, I can see the committee's got a strong interest in this. And if the committee has recommendations, particularly around this, um, uh, suggestions for change and, and how that might be taken forward, I'd be very happy to look at that. I mean, community planning partnerships are meant to be the sort of hub where everybody gets together and I think yeah. it'd be important that something as important as this is feeding into the community planning partnerships but it's something that the committee they can consider at a later stage. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? No? In that case can I thank the Minister and Mr Reid very much for their attendance thank you. Uh, and I'll suspend the meeting to witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, in agenda item three, the committee will consider the fuel poverty target definition and strategy Scotland Bill at stage two. And I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and his officials. Some non-committee members have lodged amendments that may be taken today and are likely to be in attendance later this morning. At introduction, the presiding officer determined that a financial resolution was not required for this bill. Under Rule 9126C, the presiding officer has determined that the costs associated with amendments 48 and 62 would each in themselves exceed the current threshold for a bill to require a financial resolution. Therefore, in terms of stage two proceedings, amendment 48 and 62 may be debated, but may not be agreed to in the absence of a financial resolution. The presiding officer has also ruled that amendments 93, 31, 81, 84, 82 and 85 are cost-bearing amendments. However, the potential cumulative cost of these amendments would not require a financial resolution. As such, amendments 93, 31, 81, 84, 82 and 85 and any amendments consequential on these amendments will be debated and the questions put on them as per normal in Stage 2 proceedings. I call Amendment 53 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I bring members' attention to the eight preemptions in this group as shown in the groupings. Alec Rowley to move Amendment 53 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. In moving the amendment, I would say that the purpose of this amendment is to move the fuel poverty target from 2040 to 2032. In doing so, uh, my view is that the 2040 target is not ambitious enough and that we need to be more ambitious uh, to drive the, 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 the fuel poverty objectives of government. And in saying so, you know, I think uh, taking evidence in, in, in this bill, uh, a number of members commented on the fact that since they have been here, indeed, and since the inception of this parliament, there has been targets set and missed for tackling fuel poverty in Scotland. And that in itself should be a lesson to all of us that we've got to be more ambitious. Many of those who have the broadest experience of how to tackle fuel poverty and those who work directly with those experiencing fuel poverty have told us this. For example, Citizens Advice Scotland, the Rural and Islands Housing Association Forum, Inclusion Scotland, East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership and the existing Homes Alliance have all said that we need to be more ambitious. Norman Kerr from Energy Action Scotland told us that the 2040 target condemns, and I quote, condemns <coughs> another generation to fuel poverty. We also hear that the 2032 target is more in line with the energy efficiency targets and the climate change bill. It's important that we do have joined up government if we are to succeed <coughs> in achieving the objective that we all share around this table, which is to rid Scotland of the blight of fuel poverty. This is all contingent on a strong plan and adequate funding, and we support the government putting forward an ambitious and well-funded strategy. Uh, we believe that by bringing this target forward, that would help us uh, drive that strategy. And a number of amendments that, that, that we are bringing forward uh, and that I'm bringing forward will help facilitate this. I have also submitted an amendment that gives the advisory panel the power to recommend moving the target if we discover that even under the best circumstances the target cannot be met. This is not about setting up targets to fail. It is about having the best possible statutory structures in place to prevent people from both the short and long term harm associated with fuel poverty. I accept, convener, during given evidence, that there are a number of drivers of fuel poverty that are not under the control of the Scottish Government and this Parliament. That said, however, there are drivers that are and that we are 
less ambitious in tackling. And I want to briefly give the examples. Uh, last week, I held a, an advice surgery in Balingary in Fife, and a lady came up to me who I've actually corresponded with the minister before on in terms of her house and the lack of insulation. And her problem is a problem that many people in Scotland come across where the funding that is available through the Griffin Grants is not enough to be able to pay for the types of insulation, so steel framed houses, Stuart houses, wooden framed houses, there is not enough resources there. So in terms of that, that, that driver of poverty, we're not doing enough and we need to be able to do more. Or the lady, the lady a few months ago, and again I have corresponded with the Minister and with the local authority, who brought photos along for our, our timber framed house and you could see where it had been raining and where the heaters were in the inside because on the outside those parts of the timber frame were dry so the heat is just pouring out of the house now there's loads of houses like that though that is a, a driver of fuel poverty that surely we need to be ambitious about imagine me going back to those people and telling them that we've set a target for 2040 I think the people of Scotland will not be impressed by a target of 2040. As I said, there has to be a clear strategy and there has to be funding to actually reach that target. By bringing that target forward to 2032, then it would put more impetus on the government being able to put the proper resources in so that we're serious, where we are able to influence those drivers of fuel poverty that we're able to do so and do so quickly. Because otherwise, what are we actually saying? The grants, the funding is not enough and we won't meet fuel poverty. I actually think it is, it is sad that this parliament since its inception has had the objective of tackling fuel poverty in Scotland. But now in 2019, we are saying that that target has been put off to 2040. I'll actually be in my 70s by 2040. The people that are coming to my surgeries talk about fuel poverty now will probably no longer be alive in 2040. I think we have to have more ambition, more hope, and that's why we should change that target to 2032. The amendment that I'm bringing forward does not hold the government hostage to fortune. If there's, if there's legitimate reasons why we can't reach that target, then we can change it. But let's be ambitious for Scotland. Let's be ambitious to end fuel poverty in Scotland and shift the target to 2032 and drive the ambition to tackle it. Thanks, Convener. OK, thank you very much. Andy, you said you wanted to speak, and then Annabelle. Thank you very much, um, Convener. I just wish to speak in support of the amendments in this um, group. Um, I just want to, to raise two, 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 two issues in this. Uh, in previous evidence, uh, the Minister has indicated that, that bringing the target forward from 2040 to 2032 would be um, extremely challenging and difficult. And I understand that that's on the basis of analysis that the Scottish Government has done. Now, in the absence of sharing that analysis with the committee, we don't have, or I don't have, um, evidence um, that the Minister has to defend the 2040 target. And therefore, I'd be um, interested in, in being able to see what evidence the Minister has about the difficulties, indeed the impossibilities, I think, is, is um, uh, behind some of his language previously in achieving the 2032 target. And I, I back the 2032 target on a, on a proviso um, as well. I think anyone who argues uh, that we can or cannot reach a target by a date that is 12, 15, 20 years in the future um, makes that statement with a degree of confidence. It might be a high degree of confidence or it might be a low degree of confidence. As we go forward, it will become clearer as to whether whatever target we set, 2032 or 2040, it'll become clearer whether, in fact, that target is going to be achieved or not. And I don't think there's any shame in coming forward in 2025, for example, and saying, well, actually, you know what? 2032, not going to make it. 
2040 we're not going to make it. 2040, actually, we'll make it easily. We should bring it forward. And therefore, the proviso is that the, bills, the, the bill would incorporate Alex Riley's Amendment 54, which provides for the target to be changed in light of circumstances. And that's why I'm comfortable supporting 2032, because if, in fact, it's demonstrated that that really will become impossible, and I don't think that's a view that we can take now, but it may well be a view that could be taken in 2025, for example, then the ability is there to shift that target. And I think that's a, a reasonable thing to do uh, in light of the evidence and in light of what we know or would know um, in that kind of scenario. So on that basis, I'll be voting for amendments um, in this group by Alex Riley. Annabelle. Hey, thank you. Peter. Um, I think it's axiomatic that all of us around this table want to um, see uh, fuel uh, poverty tackled, and that as quickly as possible. I don't think anyone would doubt anybody's commitment to that. Um, can I maybe just remind the committee what we agreed at stage one and the stage one report and on this issue, and it brought in the different strands of our thinking, which was... And I quote, the committee notes concerns regarding the length of the target date set out in the bill, which at 21 years is considerably longer than the 14-year target previous Scottish administrations had worked to. However, the committee also understands views that this approach is a pragmatic response to previous attempts to set a target which ultimately failed. We also recognise arguments that reducing fuel poverty will lean heavily on applying technology still in development and that it is realistic to build in time for these to come on stream. And the committee also went on to say the committee therefore accepts the government's reasons for setting the target date at 2040. This would, however, be conditional on the government bringing forward amendments to make at least some of its interim milestones statutory by way of amendment at stage two. And we are pleased to note that a public commitment has been made to enshrine two of these at stage two. If the amendments are agreed to, this should help protect the fuel poverty strategy from drift and enable a comprehensive assessment of how well the strategy is working at its midpoint. So, convener, I think that the committee got it right at stage two. Uh, and it, sorry, at stage one, and it was indeed taking into account the commitment of the minister to come forward with interim targets. Uh, and I don't really see what has changed as between our agreement, to which no member dissented at stage one in the <coughs> report, and today, quite frankly. Uh, and just to pick up a couple of points uh, beyond that, in terms of what's been mentioned today, I mean, yes, indeed, there was a target set before, and indeed it was missed. Now, to be fair to the previous Labour Liberal administration and, and then the, the first part of the SNP administration in 2007, uh, there were certain events that happened as the backdrop to that period of time, which was a global economic recession with massively increased energy prices. So I think it is only fair to put that in context. However, uh, things happen in life and it's not always easy to do, entirely predict what is going to happen, uh, particularly at the moment, within you know, hour to hour of, of the Westminster saga on Brexit, for example. So what I'm saying is that, yes, a target was set and it was missed. That, to me, would not seem to, to be a good reason to then set a target that collectively we have agreed uh, for pragmatic reasons is not the best way forward, but rather to have the target that is in the bill, 2040, that for pragmatic reasons is a target that is deemed to be achievable over that period. Now, that does not mean to say that between now, uh, 2019 and 2040, nothing happens and nobody sees an improvement in their living standards. Rather, the contrary is the case, whereas we see people move into uh, a better situation in terms of their uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and warm homes and so forth, um, as, we, as we see the years progress. And we do have the opportunity of the interim targets, which I think is very uh, important. So I think that is an important point to make, that this is not a standing start to 2040 with nothing in between. This is progress being made year on year. Uh, and also, with regard to the point that was made that, well, there can be a possibility of actually, hey, you know, we've got this wrong, we're not moving forward quickly enough, let's change the target. I think, convener, what we need is a clear plan, a clear route map, which is what the current approach is, particularly in the fuel strategy document, a clear 
plan of how we intend to get from where we are to bringing us uh, all together in terms of the target to 2040. And I think that makes sense. I think that is a reasonable way to proceed. It provides some certainty. Uh, and the, the pr approach now being suggested today, which wasn't suggested at stage one by anybody in the committee, that we then have the ability to somehow change back to the 2040 in a few years. I don't really see that that's a very practical way forward. And I don't think that's a helpful way forward uh, for people. When I, uh, you know, I'm dealing with constituent cases in Bellingbury, in my constituency, or elsewhere in, in Cowdenbeath constituency, and I see the conditions that some of my constituents are living in, including houses, I have to say, tenanted from Fife Council. You know, the first thing I do is get onto Fife Council to say, what is going on here? Come and treat this home. This is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and so I think we have to recognise that other players have responsibilities uh, with regard to the matter. Finally, uh, and as Alec Rowley uh, pointed out, we in this parliament do not hold power over all the key drivers, OK, uh, in particular energy prices and household incomes. We do not hold those drivers here. And to set a target that does not reflect that fact, I think, is actually not helpful to the people we are trying to help. I think we have to accept the reality of where we are. I would argue that the Parliament should have those powers, but not everybody around this table would convene it, but I certainly would. And whilst we do not have those powers, I think it is really uh, unhelpful and risky indeed to improving people's lives, to try to, to try to pretend that that is not the reality. I think that's really unhelpful and doesn't do the people we are trying to help a service. So I'm afraid I will not be uh, supporting uh, Mr Rowley's uh, amendments in this group. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Andrew. Kenneth? Yes, I agree with uh, what Annabelle has just said there, and, and I'd like to thank you for reading out the, the, the paragraphs from uh, page one of our stage one report, conclusions and recommendations, because it saved me having to do exactly the same thing. We did discuss this at some length, and based on the evidence, we came to, uh, as I understood it, a unanimous uh, view uh, that 2040 was realistic and achievable and 2032 was not. So like Annabelle, I'm surprised that this amendment is, these amendments are coming forward and indeed um, that they have some additional support on the committee. What COSLA has said is that they consider, and I quote, that it would be callous to implement another target that cannot be achieved. Um, uh, it's one thing to be ambitious, but reality has to actually come into play as well, which is why the committee decided what it did. If one thinks about um, what lies ahead of us, um, we are going to go through Brexit, which uh, both the UK and Scottish governments believe will lead to a shrinking of the economy by up to 8% by 2030. Also, we will have fewer uh, workers in our economy, and therefore there could be considerable in, uh, uh, issues with regard to labour shortages and in terms of actually implementing um, th this policy to 2032, even with the best wish in the world, and even if uh, finances were available. And of course, uh, energy prices, which is one of the four drivers, uh, could uh, increase if sterling uh, continued to decline. Uh, and indeed, we've seen the energy prices going up 10% in the last uh, few months. So we have to be uh, realistic if we're going to deliver this. Also, Alec talked about more funding properly resourced, but I didn't hear any figures mentioned as to how much he estimated that would cost, uh, how it would be sourced, um, um, and uh, who would, uh, you know, how the government would actually uh, be expected to actually uh, pay for that. So uh, I think in the round, uh, like uh, everyone in the committee, I think we would all want to see fuel poverty eliminated at the earliest possible date. And we would all like to see uh, uh, the government be more ambitious. I would like to see 2025 if it was possible, but the reality is that cannot happen uh, given uh, current resource uh, constraints. And, um, you know, um, 2040 actually is unfortunately the most likely date in terms of being able to deliver that realistically. But, however, if progress is made, if the, if, the, if um, you know uh, the economy uh, grows much stronger than anticipated, if fuel prices do not rise, if incomes go up, then yes, we can look again at uh, the targets, uh, the interim targets, and we can reassess and perhaps bring dates forward to 2036, 2032, or even sooner if possible. But I think uh, I go back to what Cosler said again that it would be callous 
to set a target and raise expectations that cannot be met. So I urge the committee to reject these amendments. Thank you, uh, Graham. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, convener. Um, this uh, was really one of the key issues that we, we had to deal with um, at, at stage one as a committee. Um, can I start by just saying that I don't think um, committee members uh, of any committee actually should necessarily feel bound by uh, a committee report. Um, so I fully accept that uh, the report that we produced uh, was unanimous and nobody uh, registered any dissent. But I think it's free for MSPs of any party to go away and reflect on matters uh, and to uh, then come to a different view. Now, having said that, and I made, I made the point um, during the stage one debate that I was uh, reflecting on this very issue. And I made the point that 2040 is a long time away. Um, it doesn't sound very ambitious. Um, and I think it was at that point that Mr. Gibson got quite exercised and uh, inter intervened Think, thinking that I was uh, about to demur from the committee's report. But what I actually said was I, I was still thinking about it because I think it was a, it, it's a difficult issue. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I, I have reflected on it. And my conclusion is that if we're making law, we need to make law that is deliverable and that we actually have a chance of achieving. And 2032, although it, it, it sounds it is ambitious, I think there's a good chance that we would not hit um, the, the target by 2032, but I think there's, a much, there's clearly a much better chance that we could achieve it by 2040, even though that's a long way off. My proviso to that is that I think we would need to put in some interim targets, uh, and I note uh, there's an amendment from the Minister to insert one, one date in that. My preference would be that there would be a couple of dates. So if there's not um, an opportunity at stage two, I think that's something that should be looked at at stage three, um, as well as some of the other uh, amendments that we've got to deal with later about uh, periodic reporting. So that would, I, I think, address the issue that Annabel Ewing raises about having a, a clear route map. Um, so I think if we had interim targets, not just the one, I think certainly at, at, at least two, I think two is pro would probably do it. So you'd be able to say by X date and Y date, we need to achieve this or, or that, whatever the target is. So that it's not just about 2040, it's about other dates along the road. So I think if we can agree to, obviously we haven't agreed to that yet, but that would certainly be my uh, view on things, that I would be comfortable with 2040, so long as we can see a way to uh, achieving what we all on the committee want to achieve, which is uh, the, well, the eradication of fuel poverty. I'm not quite convinced that we can completely eradicate it. Um, and I'll just go back to um, the words of Andy Whiteman in the stage one debate when he said we should take a more critical and sceptical view of targets. Mm -hmm. um, and and he's, abs he's absolutely right. We do need to be sceptical about things. Uh, and that, that's why we also need to be realistic, I think. So um, I will not be supporting um, the Alex Rowley amendments. Um, I do I completely get why he's tabling them. Um, and when I agree, what he's trying, to, you know, I see what he's trying to achieve, uh, but I do think we have to produce law that is achievable. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you, convener. I think there's been some very valid points made this morning by by members of the committee. Uh, you know, setting a target always gives a, an ambition, uh, but that is not always realised. Uh, and I think that we've heard today that we all want to do as much as we can to tackle the fuel poverty issue. Uh, uh, it's a responsibility and none of us are taking lightly. Uh, but I think that uh, 
to be realistic, uh, we have to consider uh, all the options. Uh, and I, I think uh, Mr Riley is doing it for the best intentions. Uh, I acknowledge that, but it will be very difficult uh, to be achieved, uh, and we shouldn't be putting ourselves up to potentially fail. Uh, if that is the case, the interim target that has been talked about and discussed, uh, I think, is potentially the best way forward. Uh, it gives us a, a, a stepping stone or it gives us a, a, a location to, to see uh, where we are progressing. We've already heard about the external situations and circumstances not within our control uh, that may have an impact on this. Uh, and that has to be taken into account, uh, because if we are to be uh, realistic about what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we, we cannot ignore uh, some of those uh, potential dangers uh, and warnings around the sector uh, that may not uh, support uh, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that uh, all of us, uh, and the report at Stage 1 indicated that, uh, were very, very passionate about this process, and that, that hasn't changed. Uh, we are still uh, very passionate to try to do as much as we can. Uh, but we have to do that within the limitations and the realistic timescales that we find ourselves in. Uh, and I think uh, 2040 uh, would give us that opportunity uh, and with something interim uh, will also give us an opportunity to exercise and see where we are going in the process. So I would not be able uh, either to support uh, the amendment. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, just a couple of comments I'd like to make. First of all, about the Stage 1 report, I agree with Graham that everybody is entitled to have a, a, a slightly differing opinion or, or to change their mind in some way from the Stage 1 report, but I find it a bit strange that, that on one of the most important issues where we had a lot of debate, a lot of debate, that, the, that some have, have changed their mind totally. Having said that, I have got no doubts at all that Alec Rowley put this amendment in with the best of intentions and he's trying to push us forward to, to uh, bring this about as, as quickly as we possibly can. But what I would say is, to, to one of the comments that Alec made was that the, the first target that was missed under the previous administration was a reason for us to bring an earlier target here. I would say the exact opposite. I would say that, that missing that target was such a disappointment to so many people that we wouldn't want to do that again, but also highlighted the the problems that we have in achieving it because of the lack of the, the full range of powers that we have. And, and as any country, we're sort of, we, we have to wait and see what happens with the oil prices and all sorts of other things. Uh, so I, I think it's important that we, we bring forward a target that people can have trust in and respect in. Uh, Annabelle mentioned the, t the new technologies are still to come in, but it's more than that. Things that take time, for example, our education around about how you're using it, you know, behavioural change. Was it Argyll and Butte that talked about behavioural change is going to take time and they're going to have to have people on, the, you know, at doors and, and making sure that, but, uh, what is it? It says, boots in the streets and charting doors and making sure that they start to get people educated about the best way to, to uh, change their behaviours and make sure that the, they don't unnecessarily use heating. The point Alec makes about his constituents, very, very valid point, but as Annabelle quite rightly says, it's not like we're waiting till 2040 before we do anything. What we're hoping is that by the time we get to 2040, that everything as best we possibly can eh, is resolved. So clearly, I, I will not be supporting the amendment, uh, although I do appreciate the, the reasons why Alec Rowley brought it forward. Uh, Minister? Uh, convener. Um, uh, I think uh, a good debate here. Um, is the committee no um, against uh, this change? And I, I would strongly urge the committee to vote uh, against Mr Rowley's uh, amendments, although I do recognise that they're there with the best of intentions. Um, during stage one, uh, the committee accepted it was better to have uh, realistic and achievable targets that all involved could work towards um, and uh, uh, you asked that the government amend the bill to include interim targets in the face of the bill, uh, and we have brought that forward in terms of 2030. Um, I am more than happy uh, to continue to discuss with members uh, around about other aspects of interim targets. What I would say is I would appeal that they were not too early in the process um, because we wouldn't get very much out of them if that were the case, but more than happy um, to discuss with members on the 
run up to um, stage three. Um, the committee is well aware um, that we don't have all of the powers over the drivers of fuel poverty, uh, particularly uh, the prices of energy, uh, and there, therefore our action uh, has to be through what we can do. Uh, and that is why um, we're tackling fuel poverty uh, by going for transformational change for homes through energy efficient measures. Uh, and that relies on technologies, uh, some of which are still in development. It relies on a skilled workforce and local companies to take this forward. Uh, and the target date has to be agreed by those partners who will bring about this change. Uh, the businesses taking forward the work, COSLA, uh, and of course those who own homes, owners, private landlords and RSLs. Uh, and these sectors uh, don't want a change to the target um, that is setting up everyone uh, to fail. Uh, they want to uh, work towards a target that can be achieved. Also, um, uh, these amendments being brought forward, if accepted, would mean that our Energy Efficient Scotland programme would need to be accelerated. Uh, and I've not yet seen uh, an alternative to the comprehensive route map. Um, let me mention just a few of the risks of acceleration, convener. Uh, one is that it could lead to uh, investment in existing technologies that may need to be replaced, sometimes in the very near future. Uh, and, uh, and we must uh, look at this um, properly uh, if we are going to uh, uh, reach and meet our climate change targets. Uh, of course, I'll take an intervention, convener, if that's okay. Just, it's just for clarity so that the people actually understand what what, what you mean when you, you say technologies uh, may need to be replaced. I assume you're talking about things like boilers in people's homes. Uh, absolutely. Um, Mr Simpson has, uh, has nailed that one completely. Uh, it may well be, you know, that we um, uh, move with replacement gas boilers only to find that uh, we have to replace those gas boilers quite quickly in order to meet our climate change targets. Um, and Mr Rowley, in, uh, in his uh, speech earlier, talked about the joined up government approach. And that's what we have tried to do um, with this bill, uh, with the climate change bill that will come to the Parliament very soon, and with energy efficiency. Scotland um, and you know I think that path we have taken account of all of the pieces of the jigsaw um, to get this right so so Mr Simpson is, is right um, on that point the other thing is that we could lose uh, the economic opportunities to develop skills in the supply chain um, across Scotland uh, which potentially could support 4,000 jobs because at the moment it's only larger businesses from out with Scotland that would be ready to, to match an accelerated pace. Another is a risk of inflationary pressures. If demand exceeds supply, corners could be cut and costs will escalate, resulting in even higher public spending or increased rents if costs need to be met by landlords. It also risks alienating the public. Um, cutting the eight years off the target uh, would mean speeding up the pace of, uh, of regulation and enforcement. Uh, and we have committed to a phased approach uh, to maximise the take-up of energy efficiency improvements voluntarily up to 2030 with mandatory action to follow. Bringing the target forward would mean taking mandatory action by around about 2024. Um, and this is not enough time uh, to work with the public and bring them uh, with us in all of these issues. Moving too quickly uh, may alienate them and not allow individual people and families to plan their own actions. Uh, we, of course, want to go faster. I want to go faster, if that's possible, um, which w is why we have started our consultation on the impacts of speeding up the programme. Uh, but not, we can't move fast, faster if that risks credibility in our actions or leads to people paying out more through the public purse or other means. Let me um, finish with the concerns raised by COSLA, as um, Mr Gibson has already highlighted, who point to the potential damage done in setting unrealistic targets, even, as Mr Gibson says, calling it callous to do so. Uh, as COSLA have noted, if the improvements required results in rent increasing by more than savings and fuel costs achieved, all we will have done is replace fuel poverty with poverty. Uh, and we must have a realistic starting point for the target that was, is within our grasp and can be strived for. 
2032 is unrealistic and unachievable before we have even started. It flies in the face of all the concerns that I've set out and the very considered opinion of the committee itself in its stage one report. Changing the target date risks this parliament uh, losing credibility on the issue of tackling and, er and eradicating fuel poverty. Uh, and therefore, I would urge the committee um, to reject these amendments that uh, no partner that needs to deliver the 2040 target agrees with. Thank you very much. And now uh, ask Alec Riley to wind up. Uh, thank you, convener. I mean, uh, the minister talks about the, the risk of this parliament losing credibility on, on, on tackling fuel poverty. Um, one would have to assume that that credibility exists at the present time, and I'm not sure it does. I would like to pick up on, 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 on a few of these points. I mean, the Minister talks about energy efficiency improvements, and there's a number of myths around that. There's a myth that Annabelle Ewan talked about that somehow we're just waiting on the, the technologies, and those technologies will, will come at some point. Uh, the fact is, the, the, the cases that I specifically mentioned, the, the older lady up in Blingery, and she wasn't in a council house, she was in a bot house. Uh, and so was most of their street. And when works were being done in Blingery, they got an offer uh, to insulate their houses. The minister knows the cases because I've been corresponding with them on them. They got an offer of six hundred pounds to insulate their house, and they all they, they all handed over the six hundred pounds to take it. And then they discovered that the type of house, metal frame, Stuart House, and uh, was 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 more expensive to bring about the proper insulation. And as a result of that, they are sitting in fuel poverty, not because the technology doesn't exist, but because it's more expensive technology and there is not enough funding there. So if we're going to be ambitious, then we would have to accept that part of that ambition would be to bring more resources forward. Kenny Gibson rightly asked me, well, where would those resources come from? Now, I don't want to get into politics, but I'm quite clear that my own party, if in government in West Minister, there would be over 10 years £47 billion of capital investment coming into Scotland and it's that kind of level of investment that we need to see being invested uh, in housing and other infrastructure right across Scotland. So it is a myth to say that, the tech, that this is all down to new technologies. The fact is that for these people that are in fuel poverty now and needing energy efficiency improvements, it's a lack of funding. Now, I know that that, that, that will come forward in the strategy and hopefully the financial memorandum and the commitment to finance alongside that. But if we set a more ambitious target, then there's more likelihood of actually getting more resources to deliver it. Because if you're not being ambitious, then you won't have the resources to be able to um, deliver it. Um, in terms of being realistic and what's achievable, it was almost like there was a list there given a why we'll probably never tackle fuel poverty, uh, Brexit, fewer workers, shortage of workers, shortage of skilled workers. You know, that's all got to be part of the strategy. But I don't think it will take to 2040 to be able to put that together. I'm not convinced that the people of Scotland will be that impressed that we're setting yet another fuel poverty target the day for 2040, when I'll be in my 70s, when lots of people who are living in fuel poverty today in Scotland will no longer be living. This is about whether you've got the will, whether you've got the commitment, whether you've got the, the drive to put the resources in to make this happen. And it seems that SNP and, Le and, and, and Conservative members are going to team up here today to say that we're just going to put that off into the future. Uh, I just think that's sad. I think we need to be ambitious. This parliament needs to be ambitious. Yeah. Sent from. I didn't hear all this rhetoric when we were actually debating this uh, report. Not one word I heard about all this stuff. You were as uh, you agreed with us about what was actually going to uh, uh, what, what we should do and what the target should be set. And as for this pie in the sky, £47 billion pounds over 10 years for Scotland, I mean, that's fantasy stuff. I mean, we're actually trying to d deliver realistic mm. policies for real people in mm. Scotland at this moment in time, not for some potential possible UK government that may or may not have resources to invest at some 
point in the future, Alec. That, that, that's where we are at this moment in time. But with the greatest respect, um, Kenny, you've set out the day a whole load of excuses as to why we can't do this. And the, you've got to dispel these myths, eh, 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 the key drivers. If you take a key driver, a key driver will be poverty. Um, Cosler saying that, that we would drive more people into poverty. I'm not sure where they, they come from with that. But if you take the, the, the unacceptable levels, the increases in child poverty in Scotland right now, there is there is a growing argument being put by by Civic Scotland and the Give Me Five campaign that, that to lift 30,000 children out of child poverty would be to increase child benefit by £5 a week. That is something that sits within the power of this Parliament. So it's, it's wrong to say that we don't have any influence over these key drivers. But I would, well, I'll answer the, 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 the other point Kenny makes about the committee report. What, what I've done is listened to the evidence that came to this committee, but what I've also done is talked with Citizens Advice Scotland, met with Energy Acts in Scotland, listened to Rural Islands Association Forum Scotland, East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership, have met with the existing Homes Alliance. All of them say that this target is not ambitious enough and that we need to be more ambitious with the flexibility sh to shift the target if need be. Let's be ambitious for Scotland. Let's say that fuel poverty in Scotland is not acceptable and let's Let's earn our crust by doing everything we can to eradicate fuel poverty and bring the target forward. I would conclude at that. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you thank very you. much. And so, are you going to press or draw, Alec? Press. Thank you. In that case, the question is: that Amendment 53 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Uh, those those in favour of Amendment 53. Two. Those opposed. Five. Amendment 53, therefore, is not agreed to. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with Amendment 2. Graham Simpson to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group. Um, thanks very much, Convener. I suspect this will be slightly less contentious. Um, uh, members can see the amendment, but I just, thought, I just thought it might be useful if I can just read out how the bill would look um, if, if this amendment... I don't know if it's just me, but I'm not hearing Mr Simpson very well. Right. Is there a possibility of dealing with the sound so that I can hear what he's saying? Convener, it's probably my fault. I should speak into the microphone rather than into that's, my papers. That's better, thank you. Right. I've never heard the MDC complain because he couldn't hear Mr <laughs> Simpson no, speak before. But that's, that's very true, Convener. <laughs> um, so I'll just, uh, I'll, if I can just read out how... Uh, the bill would look if the amendment was passed. It's very short, um, so it's right at the start of the bill. It deals um, with, with the target. It would read, the target is that in the year 2040, and this is how it now, would now read, as far as reasonably possible, no household in Scotland is in fuel poverty, and in any event, no more than 5% of households in Scotland are in fuel poverty poverty, which is the bit that is in the bill at the moment. So um, the purpose behind it uh, should be clear enough uh, to, to members, uh, and it is this, that we don't want to just be saying that 5% is, is our ambition. Um, we, are, we actually want to go beyond that. I think it's a very simple amendment that just clears up um, that possible confusion um, and perhaps deals with uh, the ambition that uh, Mr Rowley uh, want, wants to uh, insert into this bill, so I'll leave it at that. OK, thank you very much. Andy. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to speak to Amendment 2 in my name, um, which is a very straightforward amendment, and notwithstanding Graeme Simpson's Amendment 3, which um, proposes to alter um, the, 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 the target um, the, question, the, the fact is that the word uh, eradication, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, means the complete destruction of something. It means getting rid of something completely. And the target is, in fact, uh, 5%. Um, and that's, therefore, a reduction um, from the current rate of fuel poverty. So this is a simple language question to more accurately reflect uh, the actual purpose um, of the bill. OK, thank you. Annabel, you wanted to come in? Yes, 
Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Um, so, uh, Mr. Simpson's amendment, um, I, I think it, it probably it's fair to say it picks up on the discussion that we had in our stage one deliberations. Uh, and um, uh, so, I, I'm happy to support it on that basis. Mr. Whiteman's amendment, um, I think also I recall discussions on this point as well. Um, so, firstly, I think that. The, I, I hear what he, he says, but I think that um, language is really important in sending signals, OK? So therefore, I feel that Mr Whiteman's approach would not send the best signal. I think the best signal we can send is that we are absolutely determined to tackle fuel poverty in Scotland, uh, and that is our ambition. And indeed, picking up in the previous debate, we want to move as quickly as we possibly can, but we need to be realistic, not get people's hopes up cynically and unnecessarily and uh, do the right thing and work together according to a route map and that's what we've just agreed to do. So in that context I think it is important to, to retain the ambition uh, and I worry that Mr Whiteman's uh, a mention, uh, amendment may detract from that uh, and uh, I, I think it's also perhaps a, a, a semantic issue to an extent. And of course, as a matter of practicality, it has to be recalled that people indeed move in and out of fuel poverty. And there could be uh, very dramatic circumstances uh, which uh, in the future could result in uh, 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 that happening on a uh, not insignificant scale, uh, circumstances perhaps beyond the control of any government or certainly beyond the control of this government because as I have already said I think we had this uh, exchange in the stage one debate Mr Whiteman as I've already said this parliament evidently does not control key drivers of fuel poverty including household income we don't have control over macroeconomic policy in the Scottish parliament we don't have even as far as income tax is concerned we don't have uh, control over personal allowances. We don't have control over tax exemptions. We don't have control over VAT. We don't control 85% in terms of value of Social Security uh, payments. Uh, and that is just to name but a few. Sadly, one well, could go on intervention. and on. Indeed. Uh, I thank the member for taking intervention. I don't intend to address that uh, latter point, which I think we, we did rehearse at stage um, one. But the member talked about uh, the danger of um, changing the ambition of this bill. Um, the, the long title is not really about ambition. The ambition is embodied in the bill itself, in the sections. All I'm trying to do uh, in terms of the long title is to more ac The long title should reflect what the bill says. The bill does not make any provision for the eradication of fuel poverty. The bill makes provision for a reduction to 5%. So this is not a, qu this is not a question of whether there should be more or less ambition. I understand the member's point about language is important, but the importance of language in the long title is to reflect accurately what the bill intends to do. OK, I, I hear what Mr Whiteman says, and to be fair to Mr Whiteman, he has made this point uh, on a number of occasions, but I would suggest that um, if, if we took Mr Whiteman's approach, there would be a risk that we were actually um, uh, sending the signal, which I think is really important, that somehow we were limiting our ambition. And we're not limiting our ambition. We are very ambitious to tackle fuel poverty, all of us around this uh, committee table. But I fear that, uh, 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 in terms of Mr Whiteman's approach, that uh, actually would muddy the waters and not send the correct signal. Uh, and therefore, uh, convener, I will not be supporting Mr Whiteman's amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other members? No, in that case, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to accept Mr Simpson's amendment, uh, but not Mr Whiteman's amendment. Uh, the bill's target is for no more than 5% of households to be in fuel poverty in the year 2040. And I want to stress the words, no more than, uh, because I feel that sometimes uh, they're forgotten about. 5% uh, is a maximum, not a minimum. Our long-term ambition is that no household should be in fuel poverty. 5% is not the target because we're <coughs> reluctant to go any further. Uh, it's there because we don't control all of the drivers of fuel poverty, again, uh, particularly energy prices. Getting to 5% is realistic, credible and deliverable by 2040. But we'll always strive to do better. Uh, but people's circumstances change which uh, people can move in and out of fuel poverty, as uh, Ms Ewing has highlighted. 
Uh, for example, a huge increase in fuel prices uh, could move someone into fuel poverty, just as personal economic shocks uh, can do so too. 5%, however, is not the limit of our ambition. Our long-term goal is still the eradication of fuel poverty. Uh, and I was pleased that the committee uh, endorsed this position at stage one in your stage one report. Uh, the 5% target in the bill both relates to and contributes uh, to achieving this ambition. Uh, Mr Simpson's uh, amendment serves a useful purpose. It strengthens the bill's target so that in the year 2040, as far as reasonably possible, no household is in fuel poverty. Importantly, it does not remove the 5% target, but rather draws out the full intent behind our 2040 target, which is why I support it. Uh, Mr Whiteman's amendment substitutes the word eradication for reduction uh, in the long title of the bill. The long title states what our Fuel Poverty Act will do. One of these things will be to set a target relating to the eradication of fuel poverty. Uh, I believe our 5% target is entirely compatible uh, with this description uh, and will be even more so if uh, the committee supports Graham Simpson's uh, amendment today. Mr Whiteman's amendment dilutes and detracts from that long-term ambition uh, to eradicate fuel poverty, which is why I cannot support it. Uh, and there, therefore, I urge the committee to support uh, Mr Simpson's amendment, but reject Mr Whiteman's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. Graham, do you want to wind up? Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, convener, and uh, thanks for the, uh, all, all the comments. Um, and I think uh, the, the ministers uh, summed it up very well there that if, um, if the committee was minded to accept my own amendment, we, were actually, we would actually be saying, well, what we're trying to do is ensure that no, nobody in Scotland is in fuel poverty, and that's our aim. And so that, if, uh, if that's accepted, then uh, clearly the, the word in the long title uh, of eradication is also accepted, uh, because you know, that's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and in any case, uh, the long title uh, only says it's, uh, the, it's an act to set a target relating to the eradication. I'm a little bit surprised that uh, Andy Whiteman, of all people, has tried to water that down. Um, so I will not be supporting his amendment, but clearly will be supporting my own. Thank you. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And at this stage, I'm going to take a short break, five minute coffee break.
I call Amendment 15 in name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 16, 24, 25 and 38. Minister, to move Amendment 15 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, convener, uh, this series of amendments will improve the bill and are in line with the committee's stage one recommendations, uh, so I would urge the committee to support them. Uh, they mean we will have a definition of extreme fuel poverty and the fuel poverty gap and uh, new challenging targets for both of these on the face of the bill. Uh, putting these additional targets on the same statutory basis as the overall fuel po poverty target will bring a focus to those who are deepest in fuel poverty and ensure that the fuel poverty strategy will focus on helping those most in need and not those easiest to help. The test for establishing if a household is in extreme fuel poverty uh, will be the same as the two-part test for fuel poverty that is contained in the bill, but that to be in extreme fuel poverty, a household will need to spend more than 20% of its net income after housing costs on fuel, uh, as opposed to more than 10%. The second part of the test remains the same, that this must leave the household with uh, insufficient income to maintain an uh, sufficient income to maintain an acceptable standard of living. Sorry for that slip of the tongue. Uh, by setting a target on the face of the bill that in the year 2040 no more than 1% of households are in extreme fuel poverty, we are clearly demonstrating our commitment to prioritising those who are worst off. A target of no more than 1% indicates that we will not tolerate extreme fuel poverty. It's also a realistic target that takes account of people who might move temporarily in or out of extreme fuel poverty due to circumstances beyond the Scottish Government's control, such as fuel prices or personal economic circumstances. The fuel poverty gap measures not just whether a household is in fuel poverty, but how far away they are from the 10% threshold or from reaching the minimum income standard threshold. Again, this target will require, our strategy, will require uh, that our strategy doesn't leave behind those that, that need help uh, the most. We know that in 2015, the median gap was almost £650. <coughs> And so achieving the 2040 target of £250 will substantially reduce the severity of fuel poverty that households experience. Achieving the targets will improve many people's lives considerably. Uh, the smaller the proportion of net income that they must spend on fuel, the more that they will have for other essentials of daily life. In combination by adding statutory targets for extreme fuel poverty and for the median fuel poverty gap to the existing fuel po poverty target already in the bill, uh, we will ensure that future efforts do not leave anyone behind. Uh, I would therefore urge the committee to support all of the amendments in the group uh, and I move Amendment 15, Convener. Thank you very much. Annabel? Hey, um, I just wanted to say briefly um, that uh, the uh, Minister's um, uh, comments uh, and amendments are welcome in my view because this is something that the Committee at Stage 1 asked the Government to do uh, because we did hear evidence from a number of stakeholders including the Wheatley Group, Scottish Federation of Housing Association, uh, the uh, Existing Homes Alliance and others that uh, were concerned to note that in the bill as first published, there was no definition of extreme fuel poverty, uh, and that we also heard concerns that uh, absent such a definition, there was a risk uh, of, even if the overall target was ultimately met, of efforts being targeted at low-hanging fruit, which could therefore leave uh, a, a disproportionate number of those with the most critical needs uh, remaining in the final 5% uh, facing fuel poverty by the 2040 target. So I am very pleased indeed that the Minister has come forward, has listened to the committee and has come forward uh, with amendments on this important issue and I would be happy to support those uh, amendments. Kenny uh, Ningu. Yes, uh, I would just like to concur with those comments. I think this is very important and uh, as you'll uh, 
be aware, eh, Minister, I mean, in other comments, particularly in terms of um, rural hard to heat homes, there's quite a, a, a significant proportion of people who have who, who live in uh, extreme fuel poverty. So I think this is a, an excellent way forward to ensure that uh, we don't end up with a situation whereby the people who are in the deepest fuel poverty at the moment remain so uh, um, many years from now. Uh, it's important that all uh, groups in society benefit equally from this bill. Uh, and I think the, the phrase low hanging fruit is something which you'll be well familiar with. I mean, we have raised this on a number of occasions and we want to ensure that uh, everyone has equal access to the opportunity to have their fuel poverty reduced. So I would very much uh, endorse um, what yourself and Annabel have said in this. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've praised the Minister before, but it's worth doing it again. Um, and I'll praise him again for the way he's engaged uh, with the committee. Um, on our, our recommendations, partic particularly this one, uh, which I think is re really very, very important that we do tackle uh, people who are living in extreme fuel poverty. Um, so it's, it's most welcome. I mean, the issue was raised by a number of people, the SFHA, Wheatley Group, Highlands and Islands, Housing Associations, Affordable Warmth Group, uh, and the ex existing Homes Alliance, among others. Uh, so. Uh, you know, uh, again, welcome uh, what, the, what the ministers brought forward, and we'll be supporting these amendments. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? In that case, Minister, would you like to wind up? Um, very briefly, convener, I'd like to um, thank the committee uh, and other stakeholders um, for expressing their views in, the, uh, in this issue and by uh, cooperating with the government. Uh, to come up with the set of amendments that we have uh, put forward here today. Um, def uh, defining uh, e e extreme fuel poverty and setting very uh, ambitious targets to tackle it, I think, sends a very clear signal um, that we're uh, absolutely committed uh, to dealing with the uh, worst first. Um, I I've heard the committee again today and others talking about uh, going for the low-hanging fruit first. We know that that shouldn't be the case, um, and these amendments will ensure uh, that we are dealing with those folks in uh, the most extreme fuel poverty um, first. No one convener um, should have to choose between heating and eating. Um, uh, and for those people who experience this, tackling this problem uh, and keeping them warm and comfortable in their homes uh, is likely to have much wider benefits uh, to their lives, uh, possibly in improving health and education, uh, and also uh, has a huge benefit um, to our society. Uh, by adding these statutory targets for extreme fuel poverty and for the medium fuel poverty gap to the existing fuel poverty target already in the bill, we will ensure that uh, future efforts do not leave anyone behind. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. In that case, case the question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. If the Amendment 15 is agreed to, I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15. Minister, to move formally. Uh, moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Amendment is agreed to. Uh, I call Amendment 5 in the name of Graham Simpson, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Graeme Simpson to move Amendment 5 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thanks, Convener. I'll move uh, Amendment 5. Uh, the, uh, this, this is a, a suite of amendments uh, which uh, reflect, uh, the again, the Committee's Stage 1 report, uh, where we said that the 5% target uh, should be met uh, in all council areas across Scotland. Now. There is a couple of things to say about that. Clearly, if you were to go take the approach of saying to councils that they they should be responsible for meet, meeting those targets, they should be responsible for achieving 5% in their areas, mm -hmm. then that is potentially extremely onerous on councils. And uh, it's no wonder that we've had some pushback um, because that's what they thought the intention was. Now, my amendments do not say that. They actually place the onus on the Scottish Government uh, to ensure that the target uh, is met 
in each council area. That's not the same as putting the, put, putting the onus on councils. But it is saying, and I'll uh, go back um, to that phrase, uh, low-hanging fruit. Sorry, I'm, the convener, I'm being distracted yeah, slightly. Me. Uh, sorry, I'm just Thank you. Thanks, convener. <laughs> Um, the, 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 there could be a danger if we don't do this that the, easy, the easiest to targets areas will, will, will be picked and the less easy areas will be, will be left. So that's the intention. That was the intention behind uh, the, 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 the committee's uh, recommendation. So if we just go through it, um, the first one says that uh, ministers must ensure that the 2040 target is, is met in each council area. Ministers must do that. <coughs> then set out the approach that ministers intend to take to ensure the target is met. Uh, say what steps have been taken to meet the target in each council area. And then, and then say what progress has been made to meet the target. Um, and then uh, finally uh, say what steps they propose to take, ministers propose to take in the next reporting period uh, to meet the target in each council area. So clearly it says the onus is on ministers and I think that's the important thing. Um, so I think COSLA, hopefully COSLA can be reassured that the intention uh, is not to put, um, maybe they won't be, the minister's laughing, but certainly uh, the intention behind these, these amendments uh, is not to uh, inflict uh, more burdens on councils, but just to ensure that we get uh, uh, a uniform picture across the country when we're trying to deal with this very important issue. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you wanted to come in? Yes, thanks very much, um, Convener. Um, I, I have some sympathy with these uh, amendments. However, I'm, I, I can't support um, them. There's a number of problems I have. Um, the first um, suite of amendments five four seven uh, six uh, use the phrasing must ensure uh, as far as I am aware nowhere else in the bill is there a is there language about ministers must ensure that the national target is met um, because clearly whilst ministers of all administrations going forward to 2040 will use their best endeavors uh, it's hard to see how they could be held to a uh, a mandatory obligation to to ensure uh, it's met. Um, so I have some difficulty with that um, l l language. Um, I also have some difficulty with the the fact that this does um, imply, at least, and causes local authorities some concern that, notwithstanding the fact that, as Graham Simpson said, it's Scottish ministers who must ensure, inevitably uh, they will feel and do feel. Um, that uh, local authorities with, for example, high levels of fuel poverty uh, rates, perhaps disproportionately high as we move forward, um, will feel that their own scope for making choices uh, about how they reduce fuel poverty and, and spend the money uh, will be somewhat compromised by the pressure that may well be placed upon them by Scottish ministers in the future um, to meet a target that they have to ensure is met, and yet that it's substantially up to local authorities uh, to, in fact, uh, meet. I, I've got less uh, problems, that, in fact, with this, the, the amendments that relate to Section 6, because uh, Section 6 of the bill is the periodic reports from ministers, and it would, I think, be helpful if those periodic reports reflected what um, ministers have done, proposed to do, etc., in each local authority area. But I do feel that's probably beyond the scope of the periodic report that is um, in, 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 in the bill. Uh, local authorities will have their own responsibilities for uh, uh, reporting and, and, and publishing um, plans. So I, I don't feel that that adds a great deal um, to the uh, bill. And finally, um, as the Minister, I think, made clear in response to a question I put to him when he came here to talk about the minimum income standard for remote rural. And indeed, it has been made clear with reporting to date on fuel poverty. Um, the fuel poverty rates across the country can, and I imagine will, be reported local authority by local authority. Indeed, we have that, we have that data. 
Um, I would like to see it reported uh, according to the urban rural classification. Uh, and in fact, there's no reason why that data cannot be reported in relation to any geography um, that we wish. Obviously, not very, very small geographies, but any other geography um, within, for example, the, the area of each health board. There's no reason why that can't be reported. And that reporting will, in fact, highlight, obviously, where progress is being made and where progress is not being made. That's, for example, why we know that in Orkney, uh, fuel poverty rates are still unacceptably high. And in my view, that is sufficient uh, to create the uh, circumstances in which ministers and local authorities will work hard to make sure that those authorities where fuel poverty rates remain stubbornly high have the resources and have the tools at their disposal to be able to effectively bring them down. So what, essentially what I'm saying is I, I believe that the reporting will be sufficient to take account of any concerns that there are. And it's a legitimate concern that we may um, have a, a multi-speed approach to eradicating fuel poverty with some authorities remaining stubbornly high. Than others. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Member. Uh, Kenny, you wanted to yeah, come Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Convener. I mean, I strongly support Amendment 4. Uh, I think it follows on, actually, from Amendment 3, actually, because if we're looking at 5%. In Scotland, then, how do we make that well, by 5% in every local authority? And we don't want a situation like we have in Orkney, where I think some 57% are currently in fuel poverty. But I don't think the burden should and will fall on local authorities to reduce that. The Scottish Government, when it allocates resources towards the, uh, the eradication of fuel poverty, would I expect uh, it to do so on a pro rata basis so that all local authorities can meet that target? There's no point in giving every local authority <coughs> You know, similar amounts per capita, for example, if you know the problem is much more acute in one area than another. So I think this amendment um, uh, makes it clear where the direction of travel is and allows uh, flexibility of government to uh, dedicate its resources to ensure that you know Liam MacArthur's constituents and indeed my own island constituents are not in a situation where uh, they are disproportionately burdened by uh, fuel poverty uh, um, for years to come. So again, it's the old adage about low-hanging fruit. We want to make sure every community, every local Local authority, uh, whether people are in extreme fuel poverty or not, um, we're, we're addressing this issue across the board, and I think this amendment helps us to do that. Just to uh, uh, say briefly that uh, indeed this was an important part of the evidence that we took at stage one, uh, uh, and again it was a, an issue upon which the committee at stage one at least were uh, unanimous that there should be a recognition that the target had to be met in each local authority area, the 2040 target, uh, uh, and uh, for reasons that have already been stated that is entirely right and proper and if we didn't proceed with that approach there would be a real danger uh, that some would be left behind uh, uh, and indeed that was a point made by Argyll and Butte Council uh, uh, who had uh, stated that there was a risk with a blanket, a nationwide target, that indeed householders in remote and rural areas will be disproportionately represented in the residual, even if the 5% target were to be met. And that this is a bill for the whole of Scotland, the, our islands, our remote communities, our urban areas, this is for everybody, and nobody uh, indeed should be uh, left behind. And uh, it is also good to hear that the Minister has, um, the, the, sorry, that the, 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 the debate on this, uh, uh, so to hear from the Minister, that the debate on this uh, recognises that it is the Minister, as the committee had said at stage one, uh, is to work with local authorities to consider how best to distribute schemes to, to balance requirements and, and meet needs. So uh, perhaps we'll hear a bit more about that uh, uh, shortly. But I'm happy to support uh, Amendment um, uh, uh, Amendment 4 uh, on the basis of the 2040 target and those that relate of Mr Simpson's amendments to the 2040 target, uh, which is what we've agreed uh, in our first grouping this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Uh, are there any other committee members wish to... Uh, Liam, you would like to make a contribution. Thank you, Convener. Having been named and shamed by Mr. Gibson, I thought it, um, I, I thought it pertinent and, and, and probably advisable to, uh, to, to contribute only very briefly and, and very much to endorse the, the, the comments that um, uh, Ms. Ewing and Mr. Gibson have, have made. I, I think there is a risk in, in 
trying to put in place an overly onerous um, uh, requirement on on either local authorities uh, or the uh, or the Scottish government. I think the way that Amendment Four is phrased um, strikes the, the right balance. I think the trajectory of how we get to that target will be different um, f in each local area as a result of where they currently stand and indeed the, the local circumstances. But I think it will be seen as a failing uh, if we get to the, the point in 2040 and there is a wide disparity, still a wide disparity between the best performing local authorities and the, uh, the, the, the poorest performing uh, local authorities. And I think, as I say, um, Amendment 4 seems to me to, to strike the right balance in, in achieving that objective. Thank you very much. Minister. Um, convener, <coughs> excuse me, the committee and I are in agreement that we need to tackle fuel poverty throughout Scotland in every single community. To do that, um, it's absolutely vital uh, that we do not leave behind those in the most challenging circumstances. Uh, and that's why we have brought forward amendments to introduce additional rights um, relating to both the medium fuel poverty gap and extreme fuel poverty. And these are intended to ensure that we reduce the severity of fuel poverty experienced in all areas of Scotland, uh, whether that be Orkney, whether that be Arran, or, or whether that be in Aberdeen. Uh, and that means that we will not just focus on those households that are the easiest to raise out um, of fuel poverty. I know that the committee at stage one uh, said we should consider amending the bill to introduce local authority statutory targets. And in my response, um, I said that we need to seek the views of COSLA about this, uh, given the implications that such an amendment would have on Scotland's councils. Uh, COSLA has since made it clear to me and to the committee uh, that they have a, seri a, a, a series of concerns about these amendments. Equally, um, I've had heard strong representations uh, from Mr Simpson on his amendments uh, and also from my own colleagues, in particular uh, Mr Gibson, on this issue. Uh, and I'm aware that I have to strike a balance uh, between the views of Scotland's local authorities and Parliament. Uh, following my conversations and the original recommendation of the committee, uh, it's clear that the committee would like to apply a 2040 target at a local authority area level, uh, thereby ensuring reporting and accountability for each uh, of our council <coughs> areas. So I can confirm that I will support the amendments uh, in Mr Simpson's name that provide for this relating to a 2040 target um, we may need to consider refi refining some of these um, uh, slightly at stage three, uh, not least because I understand that local authority statistics are not available quite as quickly um, as national ones. But I'd be happy to work with Mr Simpson on all of this in advance of uh, stage three. I would also like to emphasise that such targets mean it will be vital um, for the Scottish Government to work closely with COSLA and individual local authorities to ensure that we focus on delivery. Uh, when I've talked to councils about fuel poverty and energy efficiency, the one thing they consistently emphasise is the need for lo local flexibility. Uh, and we have already made some changes in terms of local flexibilities. I want to ensure that this is possible uh, in particular, the requirement to set out the steps locally that will be taken to address fuel poverty. By having a national target and local targets, uh, we can tailor our approaches and ensure that no one is left behind. So I would support uh, Mr Simpson's uh, amendments uh, that relate to, to, to the 2040 uh, target. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. Mr Simpson, would you like to wind up? Yeah, very briefly, uh, convener. Um, once again, thank uh, thank the members for their contributions, uh, and it was particularly good to hear from Liam MacArthur, giving that uh, island perspective, uh, along with Mr. Gibson, of course, uh, who has spoken extensively in the committee about the islands in his constituency. Um, uh, and you know, it's re it's really important that 
in order to uh, deliver these targets that we don't miss anyone out and that's that's the intention uh, behind behind this whole suite of amendments uh, we'll be get, we'll be voting on it will actually be uh, amendment 4 which relates to the 2040 target amendment 5 deals with the 2032 target which we've rejected already um, I am uh, of course as always prepared to uh, speak to the minister if he feels that things need to be refined uh, because this is about making good law that works for ev everyone and particularly uh, works for councils so um, I'm happy to have those conversations okay thank you can I just clarify then amendment 5 yeah so I'll not be pressing uh, amendment 5 that relates to the 2032 yes. target thank but you. I will be pressing amendment 4 which is 2040. Okay, Graham Simpson wishes to withdraw uh, his amendment. Does any member present object to that amendment being withdrawn? Okay, that, in that case, nobody objects. The amendment is therefore withdrawn. <coughs> I call amendment four in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with amendment five. Graham to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. No. So, right, like, those, those uh, in favour of Amendment 4? Those opposed? That's six in favour and one opposed. Thank you. I call Amendment 54 in the name of Alec Rowley, grouped with Amendments 93, 94 and 95. Alec Rowley to move Amendment 54 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. The the purpose of Amendment 54 is that it allows the target to be moved on a recommendation by the advisory panel. Um, I intend to, to move this, this, this um, amendment, but except that there would need to be changes made to it at stage three, uh, because at this point it reads as advising that the target would not be met. Uh, that was clearly to, to link up with my first amendment, moving the target to 2032. However, the, the, the same principle could apply if, if the advisory panel believed that we were making good progress and could shift the target the other way. Uh, so, so this would need to be tidied up. Uh, I, I do accept that. But that said, I think having the ability to move the target is is the right thing if the advisory panel feel that either we we can reach that target sooner or or later, depending on what the the, the, the issues are. Uh, so I would intend to move that. Okay, thank you very much. Does any member wish to speak on this one? And sorry, yes, I, I wish to speak to Amendment Fifty Four and Ninety Three, which are in the group. Um, on Amendment Four, I think this is uh, incredibly helpful. It was on this proviso that I was content and agreed to uh, change the target to 2032. That's obviously uh, uh, been rejected, but in light of that, uh, obviously the language at the end uh, will need um, modified, because I do believe that if in 2025 or 26 or 27 or 28, it is felt that we can bring the target forward, then that obviously needs to be reflected in the, in the, uh, <coughs> Uh, in the in, in the bill, so I'll be supporting 54. I think 93 is a critical amendment. It was um, uh, the view of the committee that we do need more effective um, uh, scrutiny, not just of government's report, section six reports, but on the likelihood of uh, the target being met or missed, and indeed um, what. Um, the extent to which the four drivers of fuel poverty are being uh, addressed. It's always a, an issue in, in bills, setting up independent scrutiny. I'm not a supporter of setting up a, a bureaucratic organisation uh, with lots of resources. And I note Section 9 caps the, um, uh, the finances available to the panel. I think the job of this panel is to provide a very a brief but considered and well-informed and probably quite a short uh, report. Uh, to inform Parliament um, about the uh, validity of the things said in the Section 6 reports um, and to take a view on the likelihood of the target being uh, achieved. Because with the best will in the world, of course, any administration uh, will always want to say that, yes, the target will be achieved. 
uh, but some independent analysis of that is extremely useful. I would make the final point that under subsection 11, uh, where it talks about the four drivers of fuel poverty, of course it's not incomes that are a driver, although they are an influence, it's the net adjusted income. Uh, and that's arrived at after taking account of factors that are well within the control uh, of this Parliament. And, like, and, and similarly, the energy costs should relate to households, the energy performance should relate to uh, dwellings, etc. So there's some language there that will require, I think, tidied up uh, at stage through. But with that in mind, I'm happy to support all the amendments in this group. Thank you very much. Annabel, you wanted to come on? Yes, Just to uh, say that uh, on the basis of what Alex Riley has told the committee this morning, I am happy to then support uh, on that basis. Uh, uh, and since that's the wee caveat there, uh, so I expect that in line of what he said, that is what language we would see coming forward at stage three. In terms of uh, the issue about setting up a panel and so forth, um, I, I, I would again say what I have said in committee and deliberations, which is that any panel or, or, or of, uh, here or in any other area of economic activity in Scotland, you know, we want to remember that the resource resources are not endless and that absolutely the priority is always to put those to the front line, always, in my view. But I recognise that this advisory panel would have a job of work to do. And as long as it's not going to cost the public purse a lot of money that could otherwise be diverted to improving the individual's existence in their own home, then I am happy to support that as well. Thank you. Graham, you wanted to come in? Yeah, very, very similar comments, uh, convener, on Amendment uh, 54. Um, I'd be happy to support it on the basis that Alec, Alex Rowley is uh, proposing to amend it, because clearly what, what we would not want is uh, for the target to be pushed beyond 2040, and that would be, that would be a danger, uh, the way it's worded at the moment. Um, so on that proviso, I'd be happy to accept um, 54. Uh, on Amendment 93, I think that possibly does uh, need a little bit of work, not least because it refers to the 2032 target, which clearly uh, does not does not exist anymore. So uh, there's probably some tweaks required. I'm not sure if we've got time to do it for next week, but if, if not, then um, <coughs> stage, stage three. Thank you. OK, thank you. Minister. Uh, convener, having uh, considered this matter very carefully, uh, I am sympathetic to the concept of having uh, the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel put in a statutory footing. However, Alex Rowley's Amendment 93 uh, needs the refining that folks have already pointed out, uh, because it is based on that 2032 target. Uh, if, we have to, if we are to have this uh, statutory panel, then of course it must be aligned to the 2040 target date. Um, I also appreciate the capping of costs from Mr Rowley as uh, costs for the Poverty and Inequality Commission are closer to £400,000 a year. However, I think taking into account uh, we would need a, a secretariat and to go through a public appointment system um, will need to build in something uh, a little bit more than uh, Mr uh, Rowley has uh, envisaged. Um, it follows that if the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel is on a statutory footing, uh, it should have powers to make recommendations uh, which would allow the Parliament to revisit the uh, target date. Therefore, I am content to support the principle of what Mr Rowley is trying to achieve uh, with his amendments. Uh, I think they, they are proportionate uh, and they will improve the bill. However, uh, I would like to put on record that it will be my intention uh, to bring this back at stage three to align with the 2040 target date and also uh, a more realistic expenditure, uh, but keeping within a cap close to w the, the one that uh, Mr Rowley seeks to achieve. Thank, thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Alex, would you like to thank you. Convener, I'm <coughs> happy with all this, the responses to this and, and happy to... Uh, further discuss with the Minister uh, and, and at stage three address the, the points that need to be addressed in here. But the principle, uh, I think, is, is one that's agreed. OK. And your presence. Yeah, press. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed to. I call Amendment... Oh. I'm going the wrong way. Page. Yeah. 
I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Minister grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I, remember, I remind members of the eight preemptions in this group as shown on the groupings and the Minister is to move Amendment 17 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, my series of amendments are in line with the commitments I have given during the passage uh, of the Bill and in line with the Committee's recommendations, so I would urge you to support them. Uh, I committed to introducing the two 2030 targets from the Draft Fuel Poverty Strategy on the face of the Bill. Uh, these were that in the year 2030, uh, the fuel poverty rate will be no more than 15 per cent, and that in the year 2030, the median po po fuel poverty gap will be no more than £350 in 2015 prices before adding inflation. In its Stage 1 report, uh, the committee recommended we do this, stating the interim targets would enable comprehensive assessment of how well the fuel poverty strategy was working at its midpoint. Uh, you also recommended that the government introduce amendments to include a target to tackle extreme fuel poverty. Uh, I committed to doing so uh, and I sent the committee a briefing on how we would take that forward. Uh, my amendment putting a target on the face of the bill that in the year 2030 uh, no more than 5% of households are in extreme fuel poverty forms part of my commitment to tackling extreme fuel poverty, as do the other two 2030 targets that I want to see enshrined uh, in our Fuel Poverty Act. Uh, these amendments represent a practical means of maintaining uh, the momentum of the fuel poverty strategy through to the final target date of 2040. Uh, let me now turn to Mr Whiteman's amendment to set interim targets so early in the programme, uh, which would result in unachievable targets that would undermine uh, the credibility of the strategy. Uh, given that the committee's stage one report called for amendments to enshrine 2030 interim targets in legislation, um, I'm a little bit surprised by the amendment. Uh, we must be realistic in our targets and work closely uh, with local delivery partners to demonstrate progress towards the no more than 5% by 2040 target. Uh, this means making sure uh, we can take advantage of, a, of new technologies to provide people with the right solutions uh, for their homes and to better their lives. Uh, we mustn't set unrealistic, unachievable targets that do not have a credible plan for delivery uh, and risk again uh, failing to achieve them. Uh, in a briefing to the committee, COSLA said uh, that to set unachievable fuel poverty targets uh, would be callous. In addition, the government's proposed amendments are in direct response to the committee's own recommendations in its stage one report. It's also of vital importance uh, that we can set interim targets that can be met or we will risk the public and those who need our help the most losing confidence in all of us. Um, convener, I am more than happy to have further discussions around about interim achievable interim targets, um, but I would ask the committee um, to reject uh, Mr Whiteman's amendment um, and to support the amendments in my name, and I move Amendment 17. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, would you like to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. I will not be pressing Amendment um, 19. It was framed in the context of a possible 2032 target, which is now no longer uh, in the uh, a bill, I'm also conscious that the Minister's Amendment 18 uh, more accurately reflects in the text uh, bits of the bill, such as the section on meaning of fuel poverty gap, uh, which, which are, which are a, a, a absent in mine. I would, however, um, ask the Minister if he uh, is open to discussing the possibility of an additional interim target uh, between now and 2040. Uh, I'm not precious about when that should be. Um, but it seems to me that having two is not unreasonable on a um, uh, uh, on a 22, 21 year uh, outlook. I'll leave leave my remarks at that. Can we? Okay. Uh, Graham, you want to come in then, Annabel? Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, so I'm pleased to hear that Andy Whiteman's not uh, pressing Amendment 19. It clearly related to the 2032 targets. So is uh, unrealistic at the moment. Um, fully 
uh, I fully support the Minister's uh, Amendment 18, but I would go back to what I said at the very start of today's session, that I do feel there should be uh, an extra target. Um, I don't know what that should be, uh, but I'm certainly open to having discussions uh, with the Minister, and I completely agree with him that whatever it is, it should be achievable. Okay, thank you. Annabelle, you wanted to come Yes, up? just to add that, uh, from my perspective, I'm pleased again that the Minister uh, has acted in accordance with commitments that he made. Of course, I would fully expect him to do so at all times, but it is pleasing nonetheless to note that a politician actually comes and does what they said that we're going to do. Uh, and uh, I think um, I hear what Andy Whiteman has said, and I note he's not going to press his amendments. Um, I understand the context in which he had tabled them, but we have, as a committee, agreed 24 as the target, and therefore in that context it, it, it doesn't fit with the now interim target proposed of, of uh, uh, 2030. Um, it uh, would be interesting to hear uh, on the possibility of a further interim target, and I guess we'll uh, hear from the Minister shortly about that. That uh, might indeed be a very useful way to proceed in light of our initial discussion on the first grouping of amendments this morning, because to reiterate, we all absolutely are determined to ensure uh, that we tackle fuel poverty in Scotland. Thank you. For Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments before the Minister winds up? Can I just say that I don't think it's really good for the reputation of politicians for a politician to sound so surprised that a politician has kept their word. But, uh, Minister, can I just I should you wind up, please? Uh, I, 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 share, I share your view on that, Convener. I'm going to keep this very brief in the hope that you'll allow a wee break after this um, uh, for uh, comfort purposes. Um, <laughs> What, what, what I would say, um, Convener, is that I am more than happy to meet with Mr Simpson, uh, Mr Whiteman or any other member uh, around about um, putting, uh, considering putting in play another interim target, as long as that is viable and achievable, which I think everybody understands uh, that situation. More than happy to have those further discussions uh, with both members or any other member that wants to speak to me on this issue. I'd kind of finish, but if oh. the convener allows. Sorry, it was just for clarity. I, I'm grateful to what the minister has said. Can, can you confirm that, in light of the fact that um, um, we will probably be enshrining the interim target in Amendment 18, that Amendment 54 that we we just passed about uh, ministers made by regulations change the target year, um, that that should be amended at stage three to include. Um, any recommendations relating to changing the interim targets as well? Uh, I'll consider that when we have the discussions as well with Mr um, Rowley and, uh, and Mr Whiteman. OK. OK. Sure. OK, thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. This is, the amendment's agreed to. The question is that Section 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 18 in name of the Minister. Already so debated. So, so so we can just have a few votes and then come for break. Yes, of course. It's my understanding that we should be calling Amendment 55, which is also in Section 1. It's preempted. It's preempted, and oh. I beg your pardon. No, that's fine. It's OK. If I hadn't had Peter here, I wouldn't have realised that either. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, are you OK to continue, Minister? Because uh, we're going to finish shortly. OK, on you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 17. Uh, Minister, to move forward. Moved, convener. <laughs> right, the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes, right, in this case, I think we will have that very short break, because...
I now call Amendment 19 in the name of Andy Whiteman, already debated with Amendment 17. Andy Whiteman, to move or not move? Do you want me to answer for you? Ah, yes, uh, indeed, <laughs> convener. Yes, I'm not pressing this. Right, yeah. that's not moved then. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, that comes to the end of this session. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for his time today uh, and close the public part of the meeting. Thank you.